Senator McMath, you are your cleanup hitter on the agenda. You have Senate Bill One. Are you are you Senate Bill One Twenty Seven? You moving forward with that one? Oh, no, I'm gonna so you deferring Senate Bill One Twenty Seven? Okay. So Senate Bill One. Not a problem. Senate Bill One Twenty Seven. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're here for this, will be deferred by Senator McMath. And uh, on our agenda, what's remaining is Senate Bill One Forty Three by Senator McMath. I think you sure. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, Senate Bill 143 by Senator McMath is up next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, um, uh, several months ago, back in October, we had a, uh, we had a, a committee meeting um, in which uh, we, we heard some testimony. That day was pretty hectic for a lot of us. Um, uh, most of us were kind of in and out. I think at one point it was, it was myself and, and, uh, and Chairman Mills. Um, but there was uh, there was some compelling testimony that came out uh, in that committee that day, and um, it it spurred some interest in myself in regards to um, attempting to solve a you know solve an issue, um, and I'm trying to do that by uh, codifying some of um, DCFS's current policies, and so I'll just run over just kind of a 30,000 foot of what of what um, Senate Bill 143 does. Um, the vast majority of this bill deals with uh, finding and identifying kin and family, which is something that I think is we all can agree is is should be the number one priority when it comes to um, children under the age of six. Blood is extremely important there's 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 an emphasis on on making that the top priority and this bill does not change that this is a pro family bill um, I think the first five or six sections deals with uh, the requirements for uh, the department DCFS to seek out identify notify um, both the courts and uh, the relatives that they come across in an attempt to unite the child with with blood, um, this does not change that. In fact, I think it's pretty clear that it it, it emphasizes that. It, it puts a clear emphasis on family first, which is which is why the search and notification requirements are in this bill. Um, once uh, a certain period of time has lapsed, the playing field between kin and the established relationship of the child, so child in in a stable home six months it is scientifically proven that relationships are established that have lasting effect if those relationships are are moved if they're if the child is continuing to be placed in in different settings is you know six months to a two-month-old is an awful long time, right? It might, might not be very long for us, but um, it's, it's a lifetime for, for newborns. Um, so it, this, is, this, this tries to level the playing field and in, in taking into account the child's best in, interests and the relationships that are established over this time frame. And it is all dedicated to, again, the child's best interests. This is, this is current policy. Um, this is backed by... <sighs> national leaders in child psychology and psychiatry um, and it's 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 good policy and we need to we need to enforce that policy right um, and then finally it preserves the judicial discretion on best interest this is something that um, I know this uh, this committee heard I believe in maybe 2018 2019 and um, this gives the judge the discretion to determine what the child's best interests are. So this doesn't change anything um, in that regard. You know, I think we have a, a, a number of people that are willing to, that, are, that want to come forward and speak today. Um, this is, 
as I've discovered, this is a very emotional issue. There's a, there's a lot of um, there's a lot at stake here when you were talking about young children and and, and the lasting effect that uh, the way we treat them has on their lives. Um, I have received four or five uh, letters of support from child psychologists, professors from from across the country that I believe was disseminated to this committee maybe yesterday or a few days ago. Um, and and I can get into those too as 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 if as questions arise. Um, I think it it's important to um, it's important to highlight the fact that you know what we've uh, Senator Mizell and I have had several discussions or um, with uh, with representatives of uh, Department of Child and Family Services, including Secretary herself. Uh, also, Renda Hodnett has um, uh, you know been open to to having dialogue, and and I think we we all agree that um, we all agree that I think we all have the same goal, and that is to protect the child and do what is best for the child. Um, it's just how we're going to get there. Is is this is why we're here. And um, you know, I've, I've, we have some amendments. In fact, that, I don't. Why that's don't we go ahead that's and, what I was going to bring up. Yeah, why, don't, why don't we look at your amendments, put the bill in the posture that you'd like it? And I, I do want to tell um, the the committee that we have several folks in support that would like to testify. We would ask the the people that would like to testify to really talk about the bill itself and and how the bill is is uh, should should be uh, moved forward. Why don't we look at the amendments? And uh, as the amendments are being passed out. I will tell you in in our packet is um, a, a lot of information, but on page two of a handwritten bill from a ten year old a handwritten note, it basically says, P "Please change these laws to help kids, not adults." And regardless of what our thoughts are, it, it is for the kids. So just this was I, I thought that made sense that that information was in our packet. This was a note and. Um I'll admit that this was, this was the very first thing I saw when I sat down in my office this morning. Staff made sure that it was it was on front of my desk, and um, it was an interesting way to start this day that I knew was going to be you know we're going to have some difficult discussions. But I think this is exactly why we are here today. This is again from a ten year old, and and um, I think we all. Everyone has this. Is that it's right? It's in everybody's pack. You know, it choked me up, um, but I think it's important to to remember this is this is this is not about personalities or um, you know trying to attack uh, what what is an, a very very difficult job when it comes to these caseworkers when it comes to being the secretary of the department of. Uh, uh, child and Family Services. I, I know it can't be easy, um, but as long as we remember we're all on the same page here and we're trying to do what's best for people like this, I think that'll that'll help frame the discussion that we're that we're going to have. And listen, and, and I, I want to point this out as well. Um, I've had a discussion yesterday with uh, Judge Duplanchet um, from Lafayette. Correct. He's he's the chair of. Do you know the. It's a bunch of letters that I can't remember. I, I tell you, Judge Deplanche, he does so much work statewide. He's probably chair of a lot of committees, right. but he he's he does he yeah he's a great guy, and and I know he has an interest in this also. And you've he, talked to him. He does, and, and look, I'll go f as far as to say that um there you know he's got some concerns, uh, but um myself and the folks that are that are helping me uh, draft or come up with the language of this um are have committed to, and I want to make that. Uh, clear to this committee today that as this moves through the process, um, I will be. I think those of you who've known me for a short period of time, you know, know that I'll work with. I'll work with all sides in in putting this in a posture that people feel most comfortable with. Um, I think we have already made with these amendments. We've already made some of those steps, and let's talk about the. Why don't, why don't we do this? So, why, don't, why don't we talk about the amendments? Why yeah. don't we talk about what changes the amendments will cause the bill? And uh, once we do that. Why don't you, you just maybe to highlight where you still maybe see a disconnect between you and your negotiations, that, that sure. way it can help us. So, we, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have 
set of uh, s amendments uh, 663 by Senator McMath. So why don't you tell us exactly in your discussions wh where, where it came about with this and, and what does it do? Um, the majority of these were uh, derived from um, input that I received from the DCFS itself. A lot of it, the majority of it is, is clean up language, putting in a more of a consistent posture uh, with the existing law. Um, and, and if, if uh, staff, Christine or Brandy, want to want to jump in here too and and kind of run through, that would be, I think, very helpful. They've been just awesome, by the way, uh, working with. So. They do. We 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 very blessed to be able to work with the, these fine attorneys, uh, Miss Cannon. It's it's all yours if you want to tell us uh, what what this does to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the committee. So amendment number one is purely technical. Uh, amendment number two is taking the language and just making it more specific. We had the person being sought. We're just repeating language that was in other parts of the new language to make it more consistent and more specific. Uh, amendment number three is just technical. Amendment number four is same as amendment number two, just repeating the same language to make it more uh, consistent and specific about who we're talking about. Amendment number five, um, where inquiries are to be made uh, during court hearings, we're just saying it's going to be in accordance with existing law. Amendment number six, again, um, the Department of Children and Family Services would be required to file certain information with the court, but that would be now in accordance with existing law. Amendment number seven is technical. Amendment number eight um, adds a third uh, prong of criteria for the rebuttable presumption. And uh, amendment number nine just swaps out language that's going to be more specific. Um, the bill currently says that placement uh, could not be changed absent court approval. This would be more specific to say it would have to be a, a contradictory hearing and uh, the department would present evidence to overcome that presumption. Thank you. Thank you very much. And and uh, from my talks last night with with uh, Judge Deplanche, one, one of his thoughts that he did want to bring out, and I know y'all talked, but maybe you could bring that out, was that the the courts are very specific about trying to unite the the child with the family and not make this more of an adoptive process. Uh, how does the amendments and bill address that concern of his? Because I, I know he talked to me at great lengths, and he had a full docket. So I, I thought, in fairness, I'd bring that out for you as a, a question from him. So. There's obviously again. There's the the the, the first priority is is to um, unite the reunite the child with the parent or or kin or blood that has come forward. Um, uh, but and I and he obviously would agree to that. Um, I think he he had more of a concern with the the language dealing with um, the rebuttable presumption. Because that's that's obviously a legal phrase term that has significant meaning, and um, I think he he felt that that was you know that goes might go a little bit too strong in in terms of um, there's 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 circumstances that change that are different for every case right, and so um, you know you can't we're not trying to base this bill off of one specific instance um, but it is a type of of problem that has occurred um, repeatedly um, and it and it it's difficult it deals with relatives coming forward uh, after an extended period of time um, you know whereas I think you judge Duplanche is is more is puts an emphasis strongly on on blood um, and that's perfectly fine but I think this would this would clearly um, level the playing field when it comes to taking into account the child's established relationships um, that he is he or she has 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 established over you know the course of six months or, or longer in a stable home um, I think he had a little bit of an issue with mostly just the legalese the rebuttable presumption and and we're working on on something. In fact, I had reached out to to Brandy and Christine earlier this morning, um, and and have something in the in the wings that could 
deal with or address his concerns, but quite honestly, I didn't want to do anything until we heard back from him. Um, again, trying to keep the spirit of cooperation going, but I, I, I think obviously before we adopt something um, that would address his concerns, I wanna, I'd like to get his feedback first. So, and I haven't, I haven't been able to sure. do that just yet. So the, there's many questions coming up on the board. So just so for the audience and everybody, because there's a lot of people interested in this issue, if this bill would pass as amended, what would be the major changes in law that, that the, the average person would see? It would, it would clearly level the playing field when it comes to um, after a certain period of time having blood and can be, be, be equal. Okay. That's, I guess, the best way I could put it. Okay. Um, and also, it would, it would codify the, the notification and, and diligent search requirements as well. Okay. So, committee members, I see the, the board has many y'all that would like questions. Is it on, on the amendment itself or is it on, on the amendment? So, why don't, whoever has a question on the amendment, Senator Luno? Okay. You're in the bill. Senator Luno, on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the, on the amendment number nine, uh, the word indicates that, the, that they would have to overcome a rebuttable presumption of best interest set forth in the article. That's just restating what the law currently is. Am I right, Ms. Peck? We're not changing. It's, it's stating that, that it, because isn't there a rebuttable presumption already in law that, that this is, it's in the best interest of the child to be with a relative? Who, who wants that one? Brandy or, I mean, I, Ms. Cannon or Ms. Peck? I mean, currently in law, the first priority placement is reunification with the parents. So I, I guess they would have to start there. And if there was no proof for that, then they would move down. So, yes. I, I, I think kind of we're, we're splitting hairs on this language about rebuttable presumption. I think that's what the law is already. And I, and I see some people shaking their heads. Maybe they, somebody can clear it up for us later. But uh, it's, it's my belief that the law says that it's in the best interest of the child first to be placed with a relative. And that's... To me, that's a, you have to have a rebuttable presumption to show it's something different. So I don't know that we're, that we're changing anything by that, but I'd like to hear from whomever uh, has other thoughts about that. If you still want. Okay. Um, and that's correct, Senator Luno. Um, in Article 702, where the placement priorities are, the very first one is return of the child to the parents, reunification, and that is not changing at all. V very good. Um, Senator Luno, any more questions on the amendment? It, are there any other questions on the amendment? If there are no questions on the amendment, we have a motion to uh, adopt Senate, uh, um, uh, set 663 by Senator McMath. Any opposition to that? Seeing no opposition, the amendment is adopted to Senate Bill 143. So uh, we do have some questions. Senator Mizell? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator McMath. I, I think that the goal here, and, and I appreciate the efforts made to um, address what we all felt uh, was a concern from last year, I, I think the, the goal was to take the best efforts of, of, of our bureaucracy with the knowledge we have on what's good for children and somehow to make it work between the two. And I, I think you've you've done a beautiful job in, in taking the information that science and, and not only science, the, the children that we know and, and the experiences we've had one-on-one -on -one with children, you've taken that and you've put it into a, a, a practice that will allow our bureaucracy to work together for the good of the children. So I, I just wanna thank you. I think it, it's a, a reasonable ask. Thank, thank you, Senator Muzzell, and, and I, I appreciate you, the, the input that you've had uh, as we've worked together on this. Um, again, this is really, this is meant to support the policies that are in place by DCFS. Exactly, okay. and I, I, yeah, I, I, and I think what we want to do is to make it as easy as possible for us to know that we're doing the right thing for our children. So anything that we can do to define it or to, to uh, support what we know is good policy, it's all going to be uh, 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 a future investment for our kids so I just want to thank you for that you know at, at the appropriate time I know you're on the committee you can move but uh, yeah thank you thank you mr. chairman thank you senator McMahon. thank you very much pro tem senator Barrow 
Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Senator McMahon, for this bill. This is a very uh, serious matter, one that is very touchy. Um, I was very touched when I read the letter myself as well. It, it, you know, I'm always reminded that when we do things, especially with in this department, but anything that we do, always remember the children. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, prior to or in between working for the mayor as a legislative assistant and then before becoming elected as a senator, I also served with a counselor and her primary job was actually counseling children and families um, through that have been through uh, many tough situations, mostly including abuse. <clears throat> and so the, the minute I saw this bill, a lot of uh, things came back to my remembrance that I, I never forgot uh, as it relates to what I saw. Um, some of the children who came in, some of the parents who came in, and she worked with the Department of Children Family Services counseling the families and the goal was always the reunification of the family uh, sometimes that could not happen and in those cases she would make recommendations to the department as well as the attorneys so uh, again this is uh, for me a very touchy issue one that I personally know about in addition to my experience um, when I saw really tough cases, and I never forget one of the things that she shared with me. She said, even when parents have done some of the most horrific acts, the child still loves the parent. And I, I never forgot that because I remember a case that was extremely horrific. An eight-month baby coming in from the waist down was broken. I would never forget that. Um, and then another young lady who was 12 was placed into a tub of scalding hot water mm. and her skin instantly peeled off of her body. But even in that most horrific state, to me, she still loved her mom. And that was hard for me to process. Um, so I have a couple of questions. And I, I just want to share that so you can understand where I'm going. Because I, I truly, <laughs> I, I get this. Um, currently, right now, with the department, do you know how long it takes for them to get notice to um, the parental, to the parents, or to the, um, the individuals who have custody of the children you know that process the time frame for them to to identify Five, yes and I, I believe it's 30 days it's 30 and, days and i think that's federal law they so they have 30 days to do that and, and listen it actually might be helpful at this point um mr chairman and senator Madeline. if we have madeline landry I, here that's been, what i had kind of first um yeah. we do we and it maybe it'll, it'll help from the questioning standpoint okay. we do have some folks that would like to to speak on the subject matter and i, I know you told me you've been working closely with Ms. madeline landry why don't we call her up to join you in the in the testimony and as she's coming can i ask you some questions on page three yes ma'am um and the one thing that kind of stood out to me because i like to know what the process is now on line 12 um, if a relative entitled to notice pursuant to this article fails after three months from the date um, the relative receives this required notice of demonstration and interest in and willingness to provide a permanent home for a child the court may excuse the Department of Children and Family Service from considering the relative as a placement right what is the current process okay Good morning, Senators. Madeline Landrieu. I am the, currently the Dean of Loyola Law School, but I am actually here in my capacity as a founding board member of the Louisiana Institute for Children and Families, which so many of you all have supported our work with foster youth. You've met our foster youth who have come through. So that is the capacity with which I'm here today. Most of what is in this bill, not all of what is in this bill, but most of what is in this bill, and particularly, Senator, the question you ask, is embodied already in department policy. Okay. Department policy 6305 embodies the process for location. 
What the Children's Code says throughout is that persons before the court have an obligation to inform the court about relatives, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, mm -hmm. kin, family. What this bill does is place a burden on the department, which it already does in policy, but we're codifying, to actively, diligently search. Okay. Because the goal is to actively, diligently search for family early, because early experiences matter to children. So instead of waiting for information to come, we can actively go search. And the that is already a responsibility of the department, which is in policy okay. that we're embodying in this law. So there's nothing about that significantly changes. And I could be corrected by the department secretary or anyone, I stand corrected if I'm wrong. But the, um, this, that search language that we're putting in here, the timelines are similar to what the department has. So, if so, a relative, I'm sorry. Go ahead. If a relative doesn't come forward, we have in the bill for 30, for three months, it's 90 days. Those are essentially the same thing. We might fix that language, but 90 days. If a relative is known and notified, so they've got to be notified, and there's a process for notification, and it's in this bill about what that notification means. And if they don't come forward, they don't participate in the plan, they don't come forward in the plan, they ignore the notice, they don't want to participate for whatever reason, the department gets to move on. We can't ask the department to invite people into a process that they don't want to be a part of. So that is similar to what is in policy as well. So already by rule, they are already subject to do this. We're just codifying and putting it into law. Yes. So and there's also places in the law, Senator, where it gives an obligation for everybody to inform the court about what they know about relatives. Is it in rule or policy? It's both. Okay. So in the law, mm -hmm. it is tell us what you know. And in policy, the federal law says you've got to diligently search. So when you say diligent, tell me what, what, what does that mean? And, and, and do we feel like they're not diligently searching now? That is the sense of those in the community who sometimes what happens is a relative comes up after a year and a half, after two year, long times. And the question then becomes, does that relative prime because that relative is blood mm -hmm. or do the child's attachments now matter? And how does a judge balance those interests? So I think, Senator Mizell, you put it beautifully. It's an effort to take what we know about attachment and stability and the science about what happens to a child's brain when they know on whom they can depend, balanced with a relative that comes late and has avoided the opportunity for participation. So the, these are relatives who were notified, who took no action, who comes late, or these are relatives who find out later what has transpired and come forward? Both could be true. And if it's someone who, for instance, had no idea they had a child in the world, mm -hmm. the judge still gets to balance that. The judge still gets to consider that that might be in the best interest because that's family and it's culture and it's relationship and it's all that. And so the judge gets to balance those interests and nothing about that changes in this bill. Okay, so that goes back to the amendment that was in the bill. Okay, so... And I wanted, if I can, Senator, oh, sure. point out this amendment, which is important, and it was mm -hmm. a department amendment, and we really appreciated the department for this. Mm -hmm. The amendment number eight. Okay. That would be inserted onto line four, page ten. I'm sorry, line four. I mean, I'm sorry, page, page four, four. Line ten. Sorry. Three. Hold on. Page four, line 10 of the bill. That um, if no caregiver has been identified. So if a, if a, if a I'm sorry? Child under age six. Yes, it's for children under the age of six because early experiences matter. Mm -hmm. And then if a relative is in the case plan and everybody knows the relative is in the case plan and the relative is participating in the case plan, all of that is taken into consideration and that relative still is given priority okay so what we are proposing here um, what, what we are looking at here are there any other states that are actually doing it as it's written here so um, Georgia and Arizona both just recently passed very very similar legislation um, in fact they did so 
uh, with the support of of uh, their versions of the Department of Child and Family Services, and I believe Georgia's was passed unanimously. Um, and Can you it tell is, me the difference from ours and theirs? You want to get into them? The only real differences are in language. They use dependent child. It's not a word. We. It's a language. It's a. It's a law over law, but it's not different in. It's almost the same exact language mm -hmm. with respect to obligation to search, duty to give notice, what happens when family doesn't respond to the notice. So and what does that look like? What, what does there say with duty to give notice? Same does thing it give it's it, 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 it's same? Okay, it's it's same yes. in terms of the time frame. The well, the major difference, Senator, there there is, um, and if you look on page four, uh, it says it refers to the court finds that a child under age of six has been living in a stable home environment um, with the current caregivers for the past six months. Mm -hmm. I believe Georgia is twelve months, okay. right? and Arizona is nine. I think is that correct? Right. The bills, as initially proposed, were six months, and there were negotiations to take them to nine months or 12 months. Okay. I, I know that uh, stability for children uh, is very important, and what I also know is the way that we have been probably evaluating the learning, um, their experiences have been in my opinion i think all wrong because all of their learning takes place from zero to five mm. and then everything after that is kind of added on in terms of their experiences and so for me my way of how i look at teaching learning experiences uh aces adverse uh trauma experiences is so different now than it was a few years ago because of some of the programs and initiatives that I've been through. Uh, but at the same time, I keep remembering what I saw and experienced years ago as a counselor. So this is so very, very important. And for me, I'm gonna be really, really careful in terms of how I vote for this because at the end of the day, you're talking about impacting somebody's life forever. Um, right. and, and, and I just want to, I, I want to make sure that we are dotting all the, um, dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's, uh, because this is really, really important. And I see that really, truly, it's only a few months difference. I think you say 12 months in Georgia and Arizona is uh, nine months. That's right. And, and you guys having a conversation now about that? Mm -hmm. We are, Senator. Okay. And Senator, if I, if I may, just, um, the life experiences that you have, are, are clearly very moving and they've impacted you as, as I'm sure they would impact anybody to see um, the injuries to a young child that you saw um, and the power of, of blood and, and the relationships that especially one has with a mother. Yeah. Um, but I think we could all agree, I, I, I think you would agree, that when it comes to some of the abuses that you've seen, those homes were not in the best interest of the child, regardless of whether the child loved the mother or not. And I think we need to, we need to make sure that we're differentiating between the best interests of the child, the environment that the child grows up in, especially those early years, as you, as you pointed out earlier, um, and the lifelong impact that those first six years, and really, and we're, a lot of the time we're talking about the first six months, um, has on a, on a child, you can get, a child can still be, and the goal is to, to have them, their best interests, and that regards, you know, and placement and stability and all that. But when they grow up, right, when they're, when they're eight and nine and 10 and they continue to develop when they're 18, you know, I don't think anybody would, who was, went through the foster care system and was adopted and wouldn't have an interest in, in a connection to their to their parent. parents. Mm -hmm. So that is completely understandable, and I think it's important. And thank you for highlighting that. Um, but the best interest of the child, you know, this is what we're really. This is where we're focused on. So. Yeah, the letter really brings it right back to home. That's right. One last question that I have. So, if for a father, I just want to make sure I'm real clear on this. 
if a father finds out after, if this bill passes um, in its current state, after six months, then the clause regarding the language, uh, Amendment Number 9, with the um, rebuttal presumption and the contradiction hearing would allow them to be able to go back before the court to be able to explain and um, give him the opportunity. Right, absolutely. I just want why to make sure I, I was clear Why that. I, Father, yes. didn't know, no. couldn't have yes. known, mm -hmm. would not have known. Because remember, parents have a constitutional right to parenting. And there's nothing about this that changes that. So the, the, the father would still have an opportunity to say, I didn't know, I couldn't have known, I shouldn't, you know, I, there was no way I could have known. Had I known, I would have. And then the court still has the opportunity to consider that as a best interest for the child. Okay. Um, Senator, I, I want to just commend you, too, for Senate Bill 151, which you all will take up later, which is the Foster Kids Bill of Rights. And in your bill, with the 14 and 17, what the foster youth are saying, that 14 and 17-year-olds, 14 to 17-year-olds in care want, and you all be considering whether to grant them this right, is stable and supportive setting free of abuse and neglect and trauma-informed counseling. What this bill does is get ahead of that. Can we give them stable and supportive setting free of abuse and neglect early and avoid the need for more trauma counseling because we've addressed the traumas? There's nothing about this work that is easy. No child comes into care without lots of traumas yes. before they ever come in. We know that this department does its great work to not bring children in care who don't need to be brought in care. If they can immediately put with grandma off, they can immediately provide services. This department's doing everything it can to present, prevent removal. Once removal is made, this department has and does, and I serve closely with this department, as you all know, mm -hmm. they have a moral, legal, and ethical obligation to get that child back with connected family as best they can. What this bill does is say, when it gets really hard on the edges, we have to recognize attachment and stability and health of the child in their early experiences so that they can become the resilient children that you all see before this body when they've come to testify before your committee. Yes, and, and thank you for bringing that up. I, I do want to just, again, echo many of the statements. Many of you guys have always heard me say this and refer to the department as um, the heart of state government because they have to deal with the most fragile components of families when they're in their most vulnerable stages of life. And so, again, I mean, they do some incredible work. Um, and honestly, I just wonder sometimes, and I don't know, maybe they can respond to some of this as it relates to the diligent piece because that's a little concerning. Um, you know, just the lack of resources because they are, they are tasked with so much and under some of the things that have happened in the past, all of the unfortunate disasters that we have had one after the other. I just don't know if that's contributed plus um, really just how underfunded the department has been for years, and we're just kind of beginning to bring them back on task. But anyway, that that would be a question for the department. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I thank you for the bill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, th thank you, Madam Vice Chairman. Before we, we start with the testimony, just just a few things to bring out. Uh, and and can you can y'all respond to the fiscal note? And I'll read you where the fiscal note says that Review of explanation, it says DCFS reports a potential loss of federal revenue due to a potential conflict with provisions within the Code of Federal Regulations and federal law requiring court placement and kinship care. DCFS is in conversation with the federal partners to clarify any potential revenue impact. Can, can you all address that and maybe if the department addresses that? I know we're, we're policy based and I want everybody in the audience to understand that, but I thought we should bring that out because I do see a letter of opposition that also talks about that also. Can you all talk about what your research shows and is there any exposure to this legislation? Right. So, so um, when, we, when we first uh, introduced the bill and I had some input from uh, the department, there was some concern. I believe the figure of at $1.20 million was thrown around. Um, however, that, as you can see on the fiscal note, that's that's not that's not the case. Um, I've had discussions with uh, folks that 
passed a similar legislation again in Georgia and Arizona. Um, in fact, I can provide an email uh, in which the Arizona representative said that there was no uh, no negative impact in regards to federal funding. Um, I feel very comfortable in saying that this is not going to affect federal funding. In fact, I think we even, that was one of the amendments, we tweaked some language at the end that uh, initially had caused the department um, some concern when it, when it came to the federal funding issue that we've, we've, we altered. Um, I don't, you know, it, to your point, Senator Barrow, this, this department has uh, struggled with funding for, for quite some time. There was, there was never any intention whatsoever uh, of causing us as a state and that department uh, to, to lose funding, and I don't think that that's, quite honestly, I feel very comfortable saying that that's not, that's not a concern. I mean, would you agree with that? I would. Last question, we'll turn it over, because the board is clear, we'll turn it over to the, to the people that like to testify. One other letter of opposition, I thought it would be fair to at least put on record for everybody, is from a Karen Hallstrom. Mm -hmm. Karen is from River Ridge and, and basically talks about her experience. And, and in her letter, she basically talks about that historically the Law Institute conducts thorough study and research of issues engaged in considerable full, free, and nonpartisan discussion and debate. Can you address that issue? Yeah, because I, that, that, that was a lot of calls that I, re, I did receive, and Senator McMath and I talked about it. But because of these people who are kind enough to write to us, can you address it? Because I'm, I'm sure a lot of them are listening. I can. And um, Karen Hallstrom is a longtime friend. Karen and I were involved in Louisiana Supreme Court child and need of care cases back in the 1990s. I've been knowing her for a long time. She would be considered by Louisiana to be the resident expert on the Children's Code. No question about that. I looked at all of her amendments. Most of them have been adopted. I looked at all of them. Um, most have been adopted. The Children's Code Committee might have taken this up. Um, the challenge is that this issue has been going on and recurring, and the senator and those advocates didn't think that this could wait a year or two for a Children's Code Committee review. We are happy to continue to work with Karen to make sure that the language and the law is consistent because we do not want, I am a fan, having been a judge for 16 years, I'm a fan of you don't bring something to the legislature and make it up as you go because it messes with other things in the law that have unintended consequences that we hope to not do. So Senator McMath has committed to continuing to work with Karen to make sure that we are not doing violence to so probably a really bad word here, but that we are tying it back to all of the Children's Code articles that matter. Um, that's why Judge Deplanche's rule, role in this is really important because he's also as sort of the leading juvenile judge for the Juvenile Judges Association. And his concerns are not the technical concerns that Ms. Hallstrom has, although those are important, but they're around the rebuttable presumption and the court hearing with respect to removal and placement. And those are the ones the department still has a concern with, some judges still have a concern with, and those are the ones that math has agreed to continue to work through between now and House floor. Very good, because I know Judge Deplanche spent some time with me on that issue, and he talked about how you, you guys work closely together. Yeah. Senator Landrew? So, uh, Senator Landrew. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Luno, I was talking to Landrew. I'm sorry. Senator Luna. We're going to be close there. <laughs> Judge, the, you heard my question earlier about the rebuttable presumption. Is this a change in the law, or is this just restating what was what's already there? So let me see if I can clarify, because okay. I think there might be misunderstanding. Right now, the preference is, by federal law, families first, that remains the preference in Louisiana law. The reason Judge Deplanche is having this is, is that it actually flips it. And what it says is, if a child has been in care with a family for more than six months, and that family is stable, strong, the child's well-being is being met, and removal of the child will be detrimental, and there is no family in the case plan working the case plan, working with the department, then we're going to have a rebuttable presumption that the child staying in that family is in the child's best interest. Judge Deplanche has trouble with that because he doesn't want there to be a rebuttal presumption. He wants them to be, e I don't want to speak for, we're working on that language. So in a sense, the rebuttable presumption language would give priority to this. Remember, we're talking about children under the age of six. 
and we're talking about their early experiences, and we're talking about a child who is in a stable placement, whose well-being is confirmed, and who the department and the judge have decided removing is detrimental. And we don't have a family member who has responded to the notice, participating in the plan, and has come forward. Okay, let, let, let me back, back up because we're getting a little away from my issue. I'm sorry. My appreciation of the law is that it is currently and has been uh, is that there is a presumption that it is in the best interest of the child to be placed with a relative. That's correct. Okay. So nothing in this amendment changes that. Nothing in this amendment changes okay, that. Okay, so I'm, I'm having trouble about what the, what the difference is. Is it changing? Because to me, the presumption applies to everybody. It's not in favor of the, the child or the parent or the state or whomever. It applies the same equally to everyone. That is correct. So what, what is, uh, I, I'm not clear on what their problem is with the language of pr rebuttable presumption. What, so because you have to get first past yeah. the priority is for family. We've tried family. The child is placed with a foster family non-relative because we've tried family. We've searched for family. We, the department, they're doing the hard work. I'm not. The department has searched for family. The department has done a diligent search for family. Family has either not responded or has said not capable because sometimes that is the case, right? I can't raise. And so the child is placed in a foster home, non-relative foster placements. We've already gotten past the, we've tried family, family is first priority. We've gotten past that. Now the child is in a safe, stable placement for more than six months. It has been determined that that placement is stable and safe and in the child's well-being. And it has been determined that removing the child from that non-relative placement is detrimental to the child. And it has been determined that there's no family in the case planning hearing. Then this bill says there's a rebuttable presumption that staying there is in the best interest, but the judge still makes a decision if some family member would come forward about what happens. And isn't that currently the law now? I would say that is currently the practice, but it is not, and it is in the policy as okay. written to department, but not in the and, law. And, and maybe that's the distinction here is that it's in the because I know that's what's been followed for years in the in the jurisdictions yes, I practice in. So, it, it, yes, yes, it has. That is, it that has. Is I did this for a lot of years. Uh, it has. That is correct. Uh, but any in any event, uh, can I have one moment of personal privilege please, here? Please, please. I, I want to remind everybody that. This issue that we're talking about today, this part of the equation, this is the happy part because there are people competing to get these kids. The sad part is the ones that are out there that nobody wants. Yeah. So let's, let's just keep that in mind because there are a lot of competing interests here and it, it really gets emotional when you, you deal with some of these issues. So we need to, we need to keep that in mind. This is, these are good things to discuss. Very well said. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Senator. So the board is clear. We've asked the questions of the two of you. Ms. Landrieu, I know you wanted to testify, and I know you were brought up here to ask, answer questions. Is there anything you'd like to say that you didn't get a chance to, to testify on? No, only, only to say this, and thank you for allowing me to question. I'm really not the resident expert. I do care a great deal about this work. I've been involved with orphans and children in care since I was 16 years old. I've represented parents in care. I've represented children in care. It's all hard work right because nobody comes into the system that you know isn't in a hard space the question is can we minimize the hard and not add to the hard that's really the question and I think and I thank Senator McMath for offering this bill as a compromise which as Senator Mizell says brings the science of attachment the science of stability what we know about what children need their ability to depend on adults in their life with the opportunity and the real reality that children want to be connected to family and to somehow find that balance. That's the important thing. The second really important thing is that this is a pro-family, pro-return to family bill, that it honors biology and says we're going to diligently search early. We're not just going to say who's dad and not let the answer go, I don't know. We're going to say, no, no, really, you know. Who is dad? Can you help us identify dad? How do we find dad? The consequences of like all of these issues are going to be in part of a diligent, aggressive search with notice. And that's really important for us in making sure that if we can return a child safely to family, we know what those options are. 
Um, thank you very much for your time. It is, Senator, a very emotional issue. And the last thing that I will say is this is not about one case and about one family. It's always very difficult to second guess a judge who is sitting on the bench about any one decision or any family's facts about what their case was. Those lived experiences are very, very important, but this is about overall policy. What are we gonna say to our children when we know about the science of attachment and we know what their long-term health consequences are without it? Or are we gonna meet them there so that we can help them become what God designed them to be? Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, we'll, we'll call in folks that now would like to testify on behalf of uh, supporting the bill, and we'll take two at a time. Did, anything you want to say, Senator? Senator Mills, yeah, if I can just make a suggestion for, um, for the folks that are, that are looking to, to testify today, um, and, and you alluded to this a little while ago, or earlier when we first started, is that um, but we're, we're, we're obviously, we're all working towards the same goal, especially the people that are here in support of this. Um, and to, to keep the testimony to, to, to the legislation and how it, it, it might could have helped their circumstances, um, because I think this has been a very good discussion, and I, I you know, I, this is, uh, it, these, it can be a difficult discussion, and especially when you hear some of the, some of the heartbreaking stories. Um, but I just, I want to make sure that we're all, everybody here today is, is focused on, on moving uh, and working with this legislation and making it better. And, and um, I guess I, I'll leave it at that. So. We, we hear you loud and clear. And I think f historically health and welfare always opens up an opportunity to tell your story and, and, and tell your plight. I think in this case, this dovetails the, the um, hearing that, that you asked for for families to tell us what their issue is. So I think to be respectful, let's try and stay on the bill itself and how the bill will, will, will help shape policy. And if you do you know, feel that you want to testify on the issue, we, we always accept that. But uh, on that note, we call in some folks that are in support of the bill, and we'll, we'll go from there. I do want to tell everybody that of all the correspondence I have that we'll read into the record, I do only have one person that is not in support of the bill, but that was maybe before it was amended. So I, w I will tell you, we'll reserve that. But why don't we get two at a time? And uh, Susan Nelson with Louisiana Partnership for Children and Dr. Libby Sonye. And uh, just for purposes of safety, we'll, we'll make sure that uh, we kind of separate a little bit from it. And uh, welcome to Health and Welfare. And just to let the committee know, we have um, two, four, six people that have asked to testify. So um, the floor is yours, thank you. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm Susan East Nelson. I'm the Executive Director for the, of the Louisiana Partnership for Children and Families. And I will be incredibly brief because there's a lot more folks here who have a lot more detailed science information. We are asking a lot of DCFS, and I know some of you also sit on Senate Finance, and I want you to take this to heart, that we have historically underfunded under-resourced DCFS for years and years and years. So as we're making this requirement on DCFS, we need to pony up the resources so that they can do what they need to do to serve these families. Thank you. Ken, I, I know Senator Barrow has served on that committee and it's been a, a, a big battle cry of hers for years and years. So I, I'm not saying anything she hasn't said publicly and the same with Senator Boudreau and, and uh, we, we, we all understand that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Dr. Libby Sonier, and I'm the Executive Director of the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that is really a source of data, research, and pertinent information related to young children in our state. We envision a Louisiana in which all young children, birth through age four, are safe, healthy, and reach their full potential. Many of you know the Louisiana Policy Institute for Children from our very narrow and deep mission to advance policies for children to be both successful in school and in life through early care and education. I come to you today as a moral and ethical imperative to support our youngest learners to be kindergarten ready by having access to the safe, secure, stable attachments as early as possible, no matter their life circumstances. Young children develop attachments quickly. In fact, well before they have lived six months in the care of a foster parent, infants and young children are wired from birth to depend on their caregivers for protection and security. Weeks or months may seem like a short time to us as adults, but for young children, it equates to years. 
Young children are dependent on the care of others who are stronger and wiser who can have their voices be heard. This biologically based attachment is fundamental to healthy growth and development. The loss of caregivers to whom children have developed attachments has significant long-reaching consequences on the developing brain. I've spent nearly 20 years of my professional career working with families across all walks of life, in and out of foster care systems, in early childhood systems in four, straight, in four states, across multiple agencies and stakeholders. I have seen the real world implications when children do not have the access to stable and secure environments and the long lasting effects of insecure attachments as a former home visitor, state administrator, longitudinal researcher, and now as a policy expert. Science supports the three R's of early childhood, relationships with consistent caregivers, rich environments that support growth and development, and reciprocity of language and the belief that actions have a cause and effect. These three R's don't happen in isolation. They happen through meaningful, safe, and secure attachments. Science indicates that children experience, experience delays in development when their early childhood years are disrupted due to trauma, such as being taken away from an attachment figure such as a foster parent after a long duration of time. We know that 80% of brain development happens between birth and age three and 90% by age four. This is the time that the foundation of the brain, like the foundation of the house, is being built. Like a house, if the foundation is weak, you can go back and fix it later, but it is very difficult and expensive to do so. Prior to the pandemic, statistics showed more than one third of Louisiana kindergartners start a kindergarten behind their peers, and those who start behind are more likely to stay behind. Now more than ever, we need to commit to the following science of what, is, what we know is best to ensure children's ex early experiences take place in stable environments that are nurturing, safe, and secure. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. The, and thank, thank you for coming. The board is clear, so thank you. We'll call upon the next set, uh, Kim Carver and Jonathan and Rebecca. Well, let's do this because that's a couple. Let's do um, Kim Carver and Scott Sternberg, and then we'll call up the uh, next couples uh, we'll have come in. How's Gulf Coast Bank doing? All right? <laughs> We're doing well. How's your bank? <laughs> Y'all didn't bring us a PPP loan. Huh? I brought you several. <laughs> <laughs> Almost half a billion dollars in PPP loans. I know. I, uh, Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Senators on the committee. I'll be very brief uh, this morning. My name is Kim Carver. I live in Mandeville. I'm the Senior Vice President of Gulf Coast Bank and Trust Company in New Orleans, like uh, Chairman Mills just mentioned. I'm also the adoptive dad of three girls, uh, the youngest we adopted from foster care, and an advocate for foster care and adoption issues through my work as a board member of Crossroads NOLA and in my work with Dean Madeline Landrew, whose uh, knowledge and experience is well above my pay grade as you just heard. And uh, we have worked with many of you so successfully um, as members of our unofficial Foster Care and Adoption Caucus. Um, and I'm here this morning to publicly thank and support Senator Patrick McMath for authoring and bringing to you SB 143 for consideration. He is my state senator, um, and I could not be more proud or thrilled to see him introduce this bill. If passed, it will improve outcomes for children in our state who are in foster care. My testimony before you last fall was difficult because we were at an impasse on the important work and reforms that we all believe in. I am here this morning hopeful because I believe this bill is the way to get back to what we know is right. It is in line with the department's fundamental responsibility and priority to protect children from harm. This bill does two things. First, it puts in our laws what is already mandated federally, that the department quickly, within 30 days, conduct a search for family and kinship options for children coming into foster care and to report to the court on those options. Looking for family and relatives early in the process is a good thing. It is pro-family. Second, it recognizes, and Senator Mizell stated it so eloquently. It acts and recognizes on a vast body of early childhood brain development science. Placing young children in permanent loving homes is critical for childhood development. And whether in a successful reunification with their parents, in a kinship home, 
or a prospective adoptive home, wherever that child finds permanency, SB 143 expedites the process. It encourages essential bonds and it invests in the future of our most vulnerable children. And if biological relatives fail to step up early, a child in foster care can stay where they are bonded and where they are loved. This bill allows a judge to then determine, like my friend Judge Duplanche, who we're happy to have his involvement. It allows them to determine what's in the best interest of the child. It's always been a legal determination. This is a child-specific approach, if you will, instead of one-size-fits-all foster care. I'd like to close, Mr. Chairman, by informing you that similar legislation was introduced and enacted in Arizona in 2018. Both chambers, it only received one dissenting vote. And it's now my understanding from friends on the ground there that the lone senator who voted against the bill would now take a mulligan on that vote because she has learned more. In addition, in Arizona, to the unanimous or near unanimous support, it additionally was supported by both the Child Welfare Agency as well as the judicial arm handling children in need of service cases. The year after, in Georgia, nearly identical legislation was filed. It passed unanimously in both chambers, bipartisan, rural, and urban districts alike. And just like Arizona, in Georgia, the department came to the table to support the bill. This type of support existed in those states because the two principal objectives that I laid out that Senator McMath included in this bill are really, really good ones. They are good, in fact. They're so good that they're basically the existing policy, as we've discussed for the department. I applaud them for the work that they have done in, in enhancing that policy and continuing to work on it. But even with that hard work, it is always preferable for policy to exist in statute when it is good. Because sometimes policy isn't followed or it doesn't make it all the way down to the ground level into practice. Or it can change overnight with a change in administration. This is good policy put into a good bill. And I urge you to vote for it this morning and when it is heard on the Senate floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. Sternberg. Good morning, Senators. Uh, Scott Sternberg here. I uh, am here largely to uh, echo what my friend Kim Carver said and, and uh, what Judge Landrieu said. This bill is important to uh, a number of families, particularly some uh, a family that I represent. But what it will do is deal with bad actors. There are bad actors everywhere. It's going to happen. There are more good actors than bad actors. But on occasion, we have bad actors. And I have seen them firsthand. The things I have seen would shock you. If you pass this bill, if you add this law to the roles of the state of Louisiana, policies can be ignored. Laws cannot. And I'll waive the rest of my testimony other than that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And thank you for being here today. We have uh, two more groups that would like to testify, and, and they're couples. So I'll, I'll call upon Jonathan and Rebecca Murray. And uh, we, we thank you for being here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I don't think we'll make y'all separate. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Senators. Good morning, um, My sir. name is Jonathan Murray. This is my wife, Rebecca. Can you pull the microphone a little closer to you so we can hear you? Is that okay. better? There you go. Uh, we're local business owners. Uh, we're very active in our church and community. Uh, we became certified foster adoptive parents um, back in uh, 2016. And two of the main drivers for becoming foster parents, uh, number one, we, we felt like we were called by faith after uh, participating in a mission trip to Costa Rica, uh, where we spent a significant amount of time at a, at a children's orphanage, and then coupled with uh, years of experiencing infertility. And so uh, we decided collectively we wanted to open up our home. So we did that. Um, if we fast forward to present day, I recently learned of the, the Landry's, uh, another set of foster parents who are in the audience today. And, 
and strikingly similar stories and experiences uh, when it came down to uh, their children. And so I know that there's a lot of matters on the agenda today before the committee, and so uh, it is our, our hope that we'll be very clear and concise about our experience. And, um, you know, I'd like my wife to, to share a little bit about our story, and, and I would like to conclude by citing some, some case-specific um, material as it relates to our children's advocates through this uh, experience and be able to tie that back to the bill that uh, we support and are advocating for today. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, as he said, we started fostering. Um, we received our first placement. Uh, it was actually, thank you. It was actually a sibling set, and they were two siblings of four that got taken into custody um, due to severe neglect and other reasons. Um, so we ended up taking the two smaller children. They were, I'll just say, I'll name them as daughter and son. Um, they were nine months old. Son was nine months old. Daughter was four years old. Um, she had experienced significant amounts of trauma, and then she was also just taken from her two older siblings, who she was also close to. Um, so I know we don't have much time, but we spent two years in psychotherapy with her, um, doing play therapy with actually uh, Dr. Charles Zena, a very renowned psychiatrist, was actually head of our case. Um, and they were helping us get through those tough times, severe tantrums, um, learning disabilities, and many other things like that um, on the daughter's side. Um, on the son's side, he, it was hard for him to attach at first. We had to grow, I had to grow a motherly attachment. He was used to probably being taken care of by the older children. Um, he had some health issues. We worked through all that. We spent two years of our lives just pouring into these children. I do have a teenage daughter as well. Um, she helped us. She was great with the kids. Um, sorry. At the take end you, of the take day. Take your time. Take your time. <laughs> take your time. At the end of the day when I printed this bill out and the main thing I highlighted was regarding the emotional well-being of the children and just ECFS, I know that they are swamped, they are overworked, there's a lot going on there, but putting into law these things that are listed in this bill are detrimental to the, to the well-being of the children. We had some family members ruled out right away. Mother had mental illness. She even was not allowed to visit the kids after a few months. Um, the baby's dad was unknown, and our daughter's father was incarcerated for a few years. Um, going through the entire case, there's no, nothing on record stating that they were trying to locate the baby's father. Um, there's no record of them asking the teenage children, who was your mom dating? What was going on? Did anyone come to the house? So these children took to us she called us mom and dad on the very first day that she entered our home that's what she needed you know we discussed it with the psychiatrist she said that she's telling you what she needs and we were the only parents that he had ever known now we come up on a year this baby has no other parents he doesn't know we're not his biological parents i'm just i'm just trying to paint a bigger picture here um all of a sudden at that year mark we find a possible father no record of how that was found who came and told them this information um, that father was incarcerated and that father was allowed a case plan from prison after 12 months of the child already being in care and multiple therapists saying that we're his psychological parents um, and we were already to the point of adoption for both children both siblings so as you can imagine, and we are all for the Quality Pairing Initiative Act. We fostered another child who we are still three years later best friends with his father. He comes to our holidays. Um, this is about the children. This is about their emotional well-being. This is about the child then being ripped away after two visits with an out-of-state aunt to go live with her. This child had nightmares for months behavioral issues in daycare 
which we know of from different things that the family member had mentioned to people in the court or you know maybe a social worker um, and not to mention that our daughter was never taken into consideration a daughter who had severe trauma previously before entering our home was traumatized again by becoming an only child she went from a sibling of four to an only child and these are the things that are put into law here that really need to be considered we are all for biological parents like i said we if that is a good situation and that is in best interest but at the end of the day our judge stood up and said he thought that he should come home with us and he didn't know that he had the jurisdiction to send him home with us it was really disheartening we then filed an appeal in the story goes on and on for the last three years. So this has been five years total, and I still have not been able to tell our daughter that he's not coming home because she prays every single night that her brother is going to be able to be back with her. So just speaking to this bill and the emotional well-being of the children, that's why we did this. That's why no matter what happened, we're still sitting here today because the children are the reason. And when the Landrys came here the first time to present their case, I could hear it in your voice. You care about the children. You care about these bills. It, it, there just needs to be something in place where they're looking harder. After 12 months, they wanted to then bring an aunt back and see if she could adopt them after we were already going towards adoption. It's these things just shouldn't take place and it's not about us at the end of the day. We did this to help as many children as we could and we're not going to stop there. This is, this is the first step in continuing to do that. And I just really appreciate all of the hard work that everyone has done on this bill and the courage that the Landrys and other foster parents have to come forward. There's some people who are scared to death to say anything. So it's very, it's very imperative for the well-being of the children that this bill passes, and I appreciate you giving us both the time, and I know he just wants a few more minutes. Sure. Um, you did a great I, job. I really appreciate it. Thank you so, so much. You did a great job. Thank you. Yes, sir, Jonathan, if you'd like to speak, now would be the time. That's sort of our, our short version of our experience. Very short. Um, what I like to do is just take a, a technical approach to some of the things that were advocated for our children through the process of the, the first 12 months. Mr. Murray, can you, the mic a little closer. There you go. There, there you we go. go. Um, at 11 months, our kid's social worker wrote to the court addressing all parties that our daughter, MB, and our son, JB, Remain placed in a certified home of the Murrays. This is the least restrictive, most family-like setting available for the children. The children feel as if they are part of the family. JB only knows the Murrays as his parents and MB counts on the Murrays to provide her with much needed emotional support. The Murrays are willing to adopt should they become available as at 11 one ten, at 12 months as rebecca stated um the potential father comes into the picture the court orders dna tests which takes a couple of months and then upon learning that the dna test is a match um the court awarded the bio father automatic rights to work a case plan which was promoted by uh, basically the, the policy right the the law that they thought was sort of in place and so Again, we, I spent almost two years in, in therapy sessions uh, with TPEP and Dr. Charlie and, and his team. And so in learning about um, the policy to separate our children and to ship JB away to a, an unknown relative in Texas, TPEP writes on behalf, and this is the statistics, this is the data that we talked about earlier, the department has informed us of JB's biological aunt who lives in Texas and has come forward and would like to have custody of JB. The department is moving forward with visits and awaiting the ICPC for the aunt and has informed us that the agency will be recommending that JB move to his aunt if there are no concerns with the ICPC. TPEP states, we are opposed to moving JB to his aunt's home in Texas. Javier has been living with the Murray since 
September of 2016 when he was nine months old. He is currently 25 months old. The murders are his only parents that he knows and it would be detrimental to his well-being to remove him from his psychological parents. JB has been doing very well in the murder's home and they are committed to adopting. In addition, JB has been placed with his five-year-old sister, who he since was taken into care with. He is very close to his sister, who would be remaining with the Murrays. We believe it would be, again, very detrimental to JB and his sister's well-being to separate them. Should the department continue the visits with the aunt, we would like to be involved closely and would like to conduct a prospective caregiver evaluation with her. In addition, we will provide a detailed transition plan to be implemented if DCFS decides to move forward with the transition against our recommendation. That was the first letter. Our son was taken away from us and his sister in February of 2018. This is a second letter addressing Mr. Murray, who was the letter from the original one? Dr. This? Charlie Zena. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. And this is one month prior to JB being removed from our home. Again, we are writing in regards to MB and JB. Uh, as you know, they enter the care due to neglect and lack of adequate supervision. Uh, since the past 16 months, MB and JB have been living with their foster parents, Jonathan and Rebecca Murray. As you know, again, we strongly oppose moving JB to his aunt in Texas. Javier JB has been living with the Murrays since he was nine months old. He is currently 25 months. The Murrays are the only parents he knows and it would be detrimental to his well-being to remove him from his psychological parents to send him to strangers. JB has been thriving in the Murrays' home. In addition, he is very close to, to MB, his sister, who would be remaining with the Murrays as also the older children, the older siblings, with whom he visits with, we believe it'd be very detrimental to JB and his siblings' well-being to be separated. It is our understanding that prior to November of 2017, JB had no contact with his aunt. They have since had two visits together, which have reportedly gone well, yet it would not be in JB's best interest to have a perceptuous move out of state to an aunt with whom he has very limited contact, especially following all the turmoil in his life. From JB's perspective, this will create an unnecessarily frightening transition to a new caregiver situation. So that was the second letter. Ten days before we go to the hearing, um, when JB was uh, essentially awarded custody to the aunt from DCFS, our children's attorney writes to the court, JB was born on said date, gestation calculator would place conception at the end of February or March of 2015. She goes on to address to the court uh, that the bio dad who's now come into the picture was arrested and I'm not going to go into all details to belittle but charges of suspended driver's license marijuana charges firearm charges felon in possession with firearm counterfeiting felony con convictions crime of violent domestic abuse battery via strangulation and goes on to spell out the many times that he was arrested uh, between the time of JB's conception to the time that he was born and thereafter. And again, that was 10 days prior. Seven days prior, the kid's CASA worker writes a report to the court ahead of this February 27th hearing. At this time, seven days prior, our kids have been in care, 895 days. States, all of the children are living in safe and secure environment with their foster families. Whenever questioned about them having any desire to re return home with their mother, none expressed a desire to do so. Advocate, children's cost worker, expresses concerns about bio dad's desire to relocate JB to his sister or aunt in Dallas. The CASA worker feels that moving a child from his foster family, no matter the age, is traumatic, but moving him away from his siblings 
and the only stable home life that he's known would be an additional an additional trauma in his young life, not to mention the trauma of the others. Losing their baby brother to be placed so far away. It goes without saying that, that seven days later, it was determined by the case law, the very case law that we're talking about today, that the judge granted custody away from DCFS and awarded it to uh, the aunt in Texas. And I'd like to wrap this up by sharing the last two parts of that. In that hearing, which I was not able to sit at the table with all the other parties that are advocates to the children, even though that I've been raising them for almost two years with my wife. The same CASA worker who just recently reported stated that my biggest concern is that I deal a lot with children that have been through transitions and multiple placements and has MB, our daughter, been made aware of the possibility that her little brother judge cuts her off and says, I don't believe so. Talking to the point of, is she aware that he's about to be leaving today? Later through that same discussion, the CASA worker asked, when is JB moving? And the court responded today. Today, MB is not going to get to go. And the court responded, I have no control over that. At that point, I was just dumbfounded. With everything that I presented to the committee today, it was present, it was relevant. It was never brought up to promote the best interests of our, our children, of their relationship. I objected. And I'm not going to go through the whole dialogue, but basically poured my heart out. The judge responds, sir, speaking to me, as I said, if it was up to me, he'd be going home with you right now. I don't think the law allows me to do that. Goes on to say, I can only do what I'm given authority under the law, and I feel sorry for you. And as I said, I think it's in the best interest of the child. to be with you. Goes on to say, because the problem is the law doesn't allow that. It just, so one thing I don't have control over is what the law says and that's what I'm sorry about. I know it's horrible for you, it's horrible for me, but that's the one part of the law I can't control it. I have to enforce the law as it is written, which I can appreciate, however not in our circumstance. Now, I can tell you that I disagree with the law in this particular point. I think there should be something when a child has been in foster care that no matter what, when his parent steps forward and has the right to, that that can be taken into consideration. That a transition or anything, but the problem is nobody filed a petition against the father because they do not have any allegations against him, which means I don't have a right to intrude in his life or his parental decisions, and that hurts you, and I think it hurts the child. I think it's hurting everyone at this table, but the law does not allow me to do anything other than that, and I'm sorry. So at that point, our hands were tied behind her back. And we decided that it was in the best interest of our children to retain an attorney to fight for their rights, to promote what we're doing today before you. And I just have one last thing. Within that, that period leading up to that hearing and shortly thereafter, When we established that we wanted to fight for our children, 
that we didn't feel like justice was delivered in their case. We were threatened that our foster certification would be taken away. We were threatened that they would not allow the adoption to go through for our daughter, MB. So we met resistance with resistance, and we proceeded. And um, it took eight months for our appeal to be responded by the upper courts. And following that, it was a favorable ruling in which said that the judge had already arrived at a best interest opinion and um, that he had jurisdiction over the matter, which changed everything. It was a game changer. But he had to take the last eight months that he was away from his sister and our care into consideration and ordered evaluations be done. And this is one of the last things I'll address. It's a report by Dr. Charlie Zena in reviewing that evaluation. And it's five, six pages. I'm not going to bring you through all of it. States to the court that Dr. Dickinson's report, she was the, the lead expert to do the first evaluation. Testimony provided an abundant evidence that both families meet and exceed the minimum standard of being willing and able to provide safe and effective parenting. In addition, Dr. Dickinson documented an express willingness by both parties to allow and encourage an ongoing relationship with the non-custodial partner. Therefore, in this case, the consideration for the court is in which placement JB can be better expected to thrive psychologically, physically, socially, and educationally. On all accounts, it is my opinion that the Murrays are committed to his long-term well-being. They have never wavered since we first met them, and we've had ongoing regular contact with them, mostly weekly up to present. If JB were to be returned to the Murray's care, the risks to the mental health and psychological well-being are minimal, in my opinion. Given his sustained attachment to them, despite severe and prolonged threats to it, he would be returned to his caregivers. Just to be clear, this was after eight months of us not seeing him at all, and they did in-person evaluations. After the eight months, yeah. Correct. And secure attachment relationships rather than the uncertainty of a new relationship being cared for by what Dr. Dickinson acknowledged to be his psychological parents would also buffer him from all potential ill effects of the reduction in contact with his aunt. And I'll fast forward here and hit some of the, the high points here. This was never questioned by TPEP, DCFS, or by CASA. This is a warm, enjoyable, and fully engaged relationship that seems more than satisfying by both partners. The amount of mutual delight that mob and JB share was quite striking. We also observed Mr. Murray and JB many times and were impressed by their closeness and Mr. Murray's devotion to him. Amazingly, despite extraordinary limited contact, the eight months, consisting of brief FaceTime contact, one brief in contact ver uh, visit, and one weekend visit, JB clearly maintained an attachment to Mr. and Mrs. Murray through the assessment by Dr. Dickinson. <laughs> This is virtually unheard of in children in their third year of life because attachment at that age typically requires regular and sustained actual contact be sustained. JB at 27 months at age had absolutely no ability to understand why he was taken abruptly from the Murray's care, nor why he cannot see them, but only on the phone. The court should note that in my many years of observing and researching attachment in young children, this is the most extraordinary example of sustaining of attachment relationships by a young child, despite a prolonged separation that I've ever seen. <laughs> Lastly, it is a testament to the power and importance of the attachment that he has to the MERS, that he has maintained a strong and healthy attachment relationship to each of them separation. So to bring that back to the bill that's before you. In our particular case, we don't believe that there was enough done to press and enforce the ongoing issue of locating distant relatives. And when it was discovered, it was automatically granted a case plan when mere biological rights does not automatically grant paternal rights. 
and that was granted, right? And aside from that, the burden was on us at that point to disprove everything thereafter, right? And there was no additional follow-up there. We later found out that by subpoenaing jail calls that the father in question who was granted the case because he claimed he didn't know, and, and that, again, that's another matter that's before you guys today. It was determined in jail calls that the bio mom told him about his offspring, not only him, but was on a three-way call with him, the aunt, and the, and the grandmother. All of these things went before. Unfortunately, my wife mentioned that we've been doing this for, for five years. Our fight has been for five years. And as of last Friday, this past Friday, our case is concluded. And then it's so hard to continue this effort to know that we still have to go back and face our daughter to know that we fell short again and bring in a resolution to them two being able to grow up together. And so I hope in sharing our experience and then some of the facts surrounding the, the data, the science, the advocates that are being appointed here, that this new bill would receive your guys' blessings. <laughs> because I believe in it. We believe in it. And we think that it can positively impact future families and children in the future. Thank you. Thank you both for your testimony. And as Senator Luno said earlier, that thank God there's this compassionate, loving people like you. And your testimony helps us to put some clarity to the bill and the necessity of the bill. We, we truly, truly appreciate you sharing everything with us. It took a lot of courage, and thank you all so much. And I see there's uh, comments or questions by Senator Mizell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. God bless y'all. God bless you. I think your pain was felt by everybody in this room today. I have, uh, my daughter has five kids, and all I could think about was the siblings being separated. And that was just beyond my ability to grasp. And I know it's painful, but I think I want to know where those siblings are. Do you, yes. how, how was, what was the thought? And, or were you given a logic? Uh, and and well, I know we'll have people coming up, but what do you know about the, the way the siblings were are broken up? So the two older siblings, we actually um, still hang out with them. We do laser tag dates and things like that. They've been Great. adopted by another family that actually live in the area as well. Do they live together? Yes. Okay. The two older um, live together, and they're 13 and 17 at, at this stage, I believe. Um, so they are together. They were adopted. Um, and like I said, in, in our case, we, we were – expected to adopt them by the first 30-day family meeting. Um, the, their mother has severe mental illness, um, and everyone advocated for us to do that. And, you know, just all of a sudden one day, you know, things changed. And it was just very unfortunate, like you said, to all the children. Um, so the two older siblings are with a foster couple. Who adopted them. Who. who was Correct. able to adopt them. So their fathers were never found or, or there was no biological attachment. The three, the three older children have the same father and the baby had a separate father. Okay. Um, he actually signed his rights over and we all adopted at different times, the older children. So uh, JB is the only one that- Correct, his dad was unknown through this entire time up until um, really unknown until about 17 months into care. And your belief is this bill will allow that not to happen again? My belief is that this is a very strong step forward and that will, you know, have these laws in place in order for them to say on record, just for instance, 
we've, we've interviewed the two older children on these dates, these dates, and these dates to see if they knew who mother was dating when mm -hmm. JB was conceived or who was coming to the home or mm -hmm. anything along those lines. I feel like it's very detrimental that these things are not overlooked um, because then you have cases where children are emotionally traumatized <laughs> when someone pops out of nowhere and it then be sent to another state or you know whatever the situation could be. Um, so I do believe that this is a very big step in, in helping to put those things in place. And I, I pray that it would you know, largely be paid attention to and followed. So these type of things don't happen to children because at the end of the day, you are all here to protect children. We did this to protect children. And I just, you know, as a whole, I believe this is a good first step. I, I really want, uh, thank you, thank you. I, I, I just, you know, and maybe uh, a, a Madeline could, I, I want some assurance that we're putting something in place, and, and I know Senator McMath feels so strongly about it, that, that we've got, we put safeguards in, are you nodding at me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you all. God bless you. Thank you so you. much for thank giving you. us the time today. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you all. Y'all touched our heart. And I guess the last thing is, yes. you know, we have a, a, a tremendous staff of attorneys in, in, the, in the Senate and, and in health and welfare, and, and all of us work really closely with the agencies, and we respect the work they do, but no one should ever be threatened to lose any kind of Certification. So if, if you do have a, an issue, please feel free to call us because I, I will tell you there's so many good people that work at DCFS and if there is something we can help you with, that's, that's a lot of what we do is constituent services. So don't, don't hesitate to, to call on those type of issues. Thank you thank for you. saying that. We really appreciate it and we will pass that word around. Thank you. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Our last couple that would like to testify is uh, Jacob and Courtney Landry. Uh, the, the floor is yours, and uh, once again, th thank you all, Jonathan and, and Rebecca Murray. Thank you. And just so you'll know, um, members of the committee, that I just did receive just a, a few minutes ago, uh, cards of information only from DCFS and they would like to speak so we'll reserve those questions for after we hear public testimony well welcome to the committee and uh, thank you for being here thank you my name is Courtney Landry this is my husband Jacob Landry and we did get the chance to testify in October so thank you for having us back um, so brief reminder we fostered for about two years one little boy um, who we haven't seen in nine months, and we are here. Why are we here? We are here because we want to honor him and his story and what we believe his experience was. So I brought a picture for me to stay focused, and it's one that makes me smile because he's being silly, so I might look at that. Um, but we're also here because we believe that this bill would have prevented what happened in our case and will protect other children. And I do think that a sto stories do help illustrate what's going wrong currently. Um, and I, I understand you had a letter maybe from a 10-year-old. Um, this little boy left our house when he was 22 months old, and that was one of the biggest injustices was, we saw is that so many people were able to speak for him, and he, he, has no, he had no ability, has no ability to advocate for himself. Um, so I had the opportunity to read some of the expert testimony that was shared with you, which is, wasn't new to me. It was the same idea of why we were fighting what happened in our case. But I kind of wanted to share my perspective, having read letters from psychologists that talk about why after six months it can be so detrimental to a child to move out of a stable, a stable placement. Um, our little boy moved after more than 20 months, and he was only 22 months. He was in the NICU, he was in our home. So he moved out of his only home. And so when I read the, the things that experts know might happen to a child who's going to have a secure attachment disrupted, um, it's not theoretical to me. It's, it's actually what keeps me up still nine months later at night, imagining that he may have been hurt that badly, that he's going to have those outcomes. It is, this is all about one real child for us. 
and I do know him as intimately as I know my biological children because for 20 months I took care of him every day. We took him home from the NICU when he was seven months, when he was seven weeks old. He was there due to neonatal abstinence syndrome because he was exposed to many illegal substances while in utero. And for the first few months, I was his foster mother, and I was working with his biological mother with the goal of reunification. But when he was five months old, she died of an overdose. Um, and her mother is watching this testimony today. Uh, and I'll never forget realizing what that meant for this little boy whose father had already died while he was in the NICU. I realized he didn't have someone in the world now who would walk through fire for him. He did not have a mother or father. And even though I loved him at that point and was caring for him to the best of my ability, I knew I was not that person. And I just remembered feeling so sad for him at that point. Um, but then a lot of time passed and we continued to care for him and know him and love him. And no biological family members stepped forward to take care of him. And in fact, it was his maternal grandmother, his mother's mother, who approached my husband and I and asked us if we would consider adopting him. Um, and DCFS told us if we didn't declare ourselves an adoptive home, he would actually get moved to an adoptive foster placement. Um, and that was one of the first times I remember feeling that um, protectiveness that a mother feels for their own child. Just thinking, this baby, this sensitive baby cannot get moved around. He doesn't need any more disruption. And I think that just really shows the attachment that was happening between us at that point. And I've said this many times before, but when we would rationally talk about should we adopt, that wasn't our original plan. We realized that there was a baby in our home who already saw us as his mother and father, and, so that, and we felt that the decision had been made. And so we were excited to move forward to adopt when he was seven months old. And then obviously a lot more time passed. He learned to walk. He named my husband Daddy first. And um, when he was 19 months old, he named me Mommy. And the amount that we grew to love him was so incredibly beautiful, and I am very thankful that I got to experience that. But when he was 11 months old, his half uncle intervened in the adoption. And I'm not going to get into why we didn't know why that uncle hadn't been involved in his life or gotten to know him. The point was the uncle had not gotten involved in his life and didn't know him. But the DCFS immediate move was to, to say that he should go to that uncle who lived out of state, um, who he did not know. When he was 13 months old, there was a juvenile court best interest hearing, an 11-hour hearing, and the judge chose to honor his attachment. He listened to the people who knew him best. His pediatrician testified. Dr. Zeno was also his psychologist. Um, his maternal grandmother testified. She'd been involved in his life. And all of those people advocated that he stay where he was in his stable family, the only family that he knew. And the judge agreed. and ruled that that was what was best for this child, that he should avoid more trauma and possibly lifelong negative consequences and stay in his home. DCFS then and the relatives then um, fought this outcome, and nine months later, the Fifth Circuit of Court of Appeals, who never interacted personally with anyone in this case, said that the judge had exceeded his authority and that only DCFS could make a placement recommendation. And I. I, I'm unable to make any sense of any of this. My husband and I tried at that point. Uh, we felt like we were standing in between this beautiful, loved, and happy child and the chance that the, this whole world might disappear. And so we tried everything we could think of. We tried to take the case to the Louisiana Supreme Court, but in the end, they declined to review the case. Um, and we believe <sighs> there's many parts of this bill that would have prevented this outcome. Um, and, and, and similarly to Jonathan and Rebecca, it, the end of the story is, is, is perhaps the worst part because he was moved immediately without any additional contact with a FaceTime, uh, with a transition overseen by FaceTime. Um, and we felt completely powerless. And I, I bring up that, that notion of power because to not have power to protect your child is the worst thing. Um, we were told to bring him to, an air, to the airport, hand him over to a stranger to take him to strangers. And I knew in every part of my body that that was wrong and that would hurt him. And yet I was told that that's what I, I had to do. Um, there was no, I, when I think about where we were at 11, 12 months, 13 months when we were in court, there was no presumption to consider 
him staying in his home. And I think that, that th th we had no power to advocate for him. We, we also had to get an attorney even to be at the table. And so how does that protect a child currently? That's what the child would want. The child doesn't want their whole world to disappear, to move to someone that hasn't been involved in their life up to that point. Um, and so when I think of power, I think of the fact that, you know, you sit on the committee as senators, you know, based on the work that you did to get here with a great deal of power. And I mean, my God, that is such a privilege to be able to use that to protect children. Obviously, they can't vote for you, they can't donate to you, but um, they also cannot speak up for themselves. And so that's why we're here. We want to try to voice for this child what happened, not knowing how he is right now. Um, and obviously, it's not an isolated case. Thank you, Ms. Landry. There's obviously a very, very strong preference for blood relatives to be involved in children's cases. And if my nephew had been taken into foster care uh, in South Carolina, where my sister-in-law lives, I would have been there the very first day. And I would have beaten down doors to ensure that that child was in my home. This is not a situation like that. This is a situation where mom and dad were gone. They, are, they passed away. There is a situation, it's a situation where no one was beating down doors to come and take care of this child. We spent, there honestly is no preparation uh, for someone to take home a child who's been addicted to cocaine, barbiturates, heroin, and then on methadone uh, for two months in order to wean him off of all of those other drugs. For the first three months in our house, he had to be held 24 seven. We had an army of ladies from our church at our house all the time so that we could sleep and we could spend time with our three other biological children. Um, no one else was doing that for this child. And yet the knee jerk reaction when someone shows up in both of these cases is for the department to say that is where this child should go, no questions asked. And what we hope, and that is not what their own policy says, and that is the problem because there is a severe disconnect right now between their internal policies and what is in law. And there is a gap in the judiciary in terms of understanding and, and facilitating. The, the Murrays and we had the same juvenile court judge and the same appellate court, and they both reached opposite decisions in our cases. We believe that their case informed his decision in our case, but it was a totally different panel at the appellate court. And it's because of this massive gap in law and because of the way the department advocates for sending children to blood relatives no matter the circumstances. The experts are clear and unequivocal about this, but you don't even need an expert. All you need to do is imagine your own two-year-old who has only known you as a parent or your grandchild who has only known your child as their parent. Just imagine going to an airport and handing that child to a stranger and hearing that child scream mommy for 45 minutes without any knowledge of how much longer he screamed, just to be then handed to other strangers to live the rest of his life. To have four FaceTime calls with the only parents he has ever known for his entire life. And then to be said, to be told by a court appointed psych or a DCFS appointed psychiatrist that he is fully transitioned and has no need for you anymore. It is unconscionable. And this has happened to family after family after family. We are here on the wings and prayers of other families who have reached out who are too afraid to speak. There's an African American pastor and his wife in New Orleans who we've been in close contact with. Had their girls for a year. An aunt came into the picture. DCFS said they must go to the aunt. The courts felt their hands were tied. They go to the aunt. Eight months later, the aunt cannot handle it. They come back. And they are two weeks away from adoption, and they are petrified of testifying in public because they don't want that adoption justified, je jeopardized. But they have said that their daughters are completely different people because every time a transition like this happens, trauma happens. In the case of our son, uh, there were at least eight aces, if you're familiar with that term, which I'm sure you are, that had happened in his life. Drugs in utero, depressed mother, mother incarcerated in the first trimester, all of which research says are very clearly tied to 
challenging outcomes. And then another massive trauma was forced on him at two years old. This can't continue to happen. And our hope is that, number one, in our, in our case, if uncle was there and interested, he would have ident been identified and incorporated into the plan immediately. Six months is too long. 30 days, in my mind, is long enough. But six months is more than enough time to figure this out. If, if our son would have been, tr been transitioned at six or nine months, it would have been a completely different story and transitioned humanely, not taken from our arms and never see us, to never see us again. Um, and then to be able to recognize that foster families who have, who have done the incredibly difficult work and with whom the child has an attachment as parents, they need to be recognized as, as something meaningful in this case when determining what the best interest is for the child. I don't know if this bill in and of itself will fix the depths of the problems that we experience, but I do believe that it is a very big first step and I sincerely appreciate the hard questions you're asking, the amendments that you're willing to put on it in order to make it better and stronger, and uh, I thank you sincerely for, for your time and effort in that. We appreciate you being here for the second time to give us testimony and clarity and also where the bill would have some good implementation. We, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry. Senator Ward did have a question. Senator Ward? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I really just wanted to thank both y'all and the Murrays for coming to um, say what you had to say. I, I have uh, a number of friends that do a lot of foster work, and I've, I've watched them go through uh, a number of things and just – the way y'all are willing to put yourselves out there, um, even had this circumstance never happened, you gain an emotional attachment, and you're willing to do that in an effort to change a child's life, and that's uh, so commendable. But, you know, the what we run into as a legislator and a legislature is – these situations that we have to fix because things like this are just horrific when they happen and it's because the law has no emotion and what is so problematic about that is a lot of times we contemplate the worst case scenario or the best case scenario and nothing in between and so you know i'm i wasn't here many years ago probably none of us were whenever um, they put the law on the books that that makes things what they are now but i think uh for the most part us here want to see we want to see things change and i don't know how you ever argue against uh giving the judge the flexibility to doing what's in the best interest of the child so uh, i say all that to thank both of both both couples for coming forward and telling your story um i know it's not easy to do and i know you you probably speak for uh for others and this is no no slight towards uh dcfs this is no slight towards anyone it's just a situation that that gets brought out that we have to deal with and we have to correct so uh no family no child has to go through it in the future and we'll continue to try and make things better until we get there so thank you thank you well said senator ward um there's no further questions thank you so much for your testimony while we call the department up i'll, I'll read into the record uh support and opposition but right now i think uh secretary walters would like to address this and uh rinda hondit also with dcfs so while y'all approaching the table and we we make preparations for your testimony what I read in support, uh, we, we did read in to support everybody that testified. The only person that submitted a green card that didn't testify was with the Louisiana Family Forum. Christy Cross is in support but not to speak. Um, you did see in your packet a, 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 a really touching letter from a 10-year-old, so I'll put her in the record. Haley Stella Kilpatrick Stone in support. Casey Kilpatrick, foster parents. Kim Bigliger uh, in support of 143, David Richard in support, Terry Harsbark, oh, my Cajun accent can't get this one, I'll spell it, H-R-A-B-O-V-S-K-Y in support, 
uh, and Anna Palmer in support. Paula Pastorek, former state superintendent of education. Paul Pastorek, former state superintendent of education. Uh, a, a very compelling letter was was submitted to us, and a lot of this testimony was brought out from uh, Charles H. Zena, who uh, is with T Tulane. And basically, I'll just read into the record his last thoughts. Therefore, I commend the committee on this legislation as written. I believe, if passed, it will be an important step forward in our efforts to protect the most vulnerable. And that is in support. In opposition, I, I did bring out in testimony the concerns, some of the concerns of, of Karen Hallstrom, who uh, Judge Landrew talked about, and that they will work together on that, along with Judge Tommy uh, Deplanche, and uh, his, his her concerns with the Law Institute and some of the verbiage. So I think I've touched on everybody that has either written to us or this this all I went over was in the emails that were sent to the committee so uh, madam secretary welcome and uh, welcome to both of you and uh, we, we welcome any input that you can give us thank you Marquita Garner Walters secretary of the Department of Children and Family Services and thank you members this has been a very emotional day we um, have also provided you, I think, with our policy uh, on placement and care of children. We also did, uh, you should have all received the report that was, um, that came out last October that in, in the um, work that was requested of us that addresses a lot of these issues. Just, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you at all, Madam Secretary, but it was kind of said what was they don't have anything in their packet the members that's right, the that's policy. what they were asking about okay maybe they're distributing it now yes sir. yes sir. We'll, is, we'll get that passed out to everybody okay. right now that is um the result of a lot of work that came out of the report and the um from the resolution that senators mizell and mcmath brought earlier the department has worked really hard to try to incorporate in great detail, and if you read through it, it's about eight pages. I, I would let you know that that's just one piece of policy and a book of a lot of policy, but it goes into great detail for our workers how they are to um, behave and all the steps that they need to go through as they um, do placement. We appreciate this bill from Senator McMath. I believe with everything in me, he has the best interest of children at heart, and we are committed to working with him. Our intent is just to get the very best language into this bill as it becomes law as possible. We have worked with Dr. Zena. We have worked with Crossroads NOLA and many of the advocates that um, have green cards in on this who are foster parent support groups that we work with closely all the time and respect their work immensely and the work that they do on behalf of, of our foster families. And we, we agree completely with the science, the attachment science that we know and hold dear and follow in our agency. And so we are simply trying to get the very best language into the bill as it becomes law. You will see our policy goes deeper than this bill does um, because we have to be that explicit in policy because it is complicated. These cases are never easy. You have heard stories about how difficult these, um, these decisions are even for the judiciary. And we want the law to be as strong as it can be and to be the right law. And so we have committed to working with Senator McMath to get that done. And unless you have any questions for us, that's what we have. Madam Secretary, I, I want to commend you because I, I know after the hearing in October, you, you did kind of a house-to-house -house call on the membership and the committee to talk about issues that you felt maybe were in litigation and, and maybe it, it should be a one-on-one -on -one discussion. So I want to thank you on that. And I do see some a question by Senator Barrow. I did see in the policy itself, and I'm looking at it for, for, you know, right now, but I see on page three, it said for relatives, uh, first, second sentence on the second full paragraph, it says for relatives who were sent a relative notification form, it expected they will make their interest and intent regarding the child known to the department within 60 days. Mm -hmm. Does that, from the 30 days that 
you and, and Senator McMath and, and your team are working with, does that conflict any of the notification timelines or no, I, timelines? I'm sorry, Renda Hodnett, Assistant Secretary, DCFS. I do not think that conflicts at all with what he's saying. In fact, this is um, much more stringent. This okay. says that once notified, that we expect that within 60 days, they will make their interest known um, for placement or involvement in the child's life. I believe what you're referring to in Senator McMath's bill is that 30, within the first 30, 30 days. days, we should be initiating um, or completing um, a diligent search for, for relatives. And in fact, in our policy, um, we expect that it will be done within the first 10 days. Okay. And so it is initiated then all information that is available within the first 10 days is expected to be documented we or um, in our policy it calls for the information to be submitted to the court along with the first case plan which is due within 60 days um, and it requires an ongoing um, diligent search for families so our policy in my opinion is even more okay um, very more very good and just to you know, we, we did talk about it earlier, Was uh, or I did bring it up, the fiscal note, and the fiscal note did have right. so a, the a, a note, small blurb at the end with the federal funding. Can you address that from your vantage point? Sure. So there are a couple of concerns about the bill as it was originally drafted. And so we um, understand that there are some amendments. We have seen some of the amendments. Um, it is our... Um, understanding that there are, there are more in the works um, so I don't have them all and I think that some of them could matter so primarily the things that the Fed say is that um, you cannot usurp the department's authority around care and placement so the department is is the one who is supposed to make placement of a child and so um, there was concern that in the original language where it talked about um, not, a couple of things, where it talked about not being able to move a child without going to a court hearing. That's one piece that appears to be problematic. The other one is whether or not it would create um, a class of children or a blanket um, category policy. What the Fed say is that each case must be individualized and so um, they have expressed some concern about that. However, they have not given us yet um, a definitive answer. Um, we work with our feds in Dallas, who are our local feds, and then they are seeking clearance from D.C. So there are a couple things. And I understand that there is not and has not been an issue with Arizona or yeah. um, Georgia. 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 However, as I read it, those are different um, different bills they, they address some different things so i'm not sure that it's exactly apples and apples so and there is one other piece that the feds we have asked for clarification on and it is about the um permanency um the permanency goals so it would relate to page three where um line 24 um adoption or kinship care and so I believe that the amendments may address some of that, but we are seeking clarification about exactly how kinship care is defined. There are multiple ways that kinship care is used, and some of it matters where it's placed. So it, if, if a judge um, approves a permanency plan that is not one of the permanency plans that the feds a line out then it could threaten federal funds so that's why it's just undeterminable at this moment um, what they have said is we have some concerns we have some questions that have to be answered and we have to get back to you so uh, you, you've given us some food for thought and, and and you know I know we all work closely together with the department and with Senator McMath and us. as you guys have seen this thing evolving if you see concerns please please let our our, our Senate attorneys know that Sure. I'm sure. You know, I know that there is no intention by Senator McMath sure. for this to be a, we know a, that. a financial. But, but it is um, good to all be on the same page. Back to the, the department. So okay. That's why we're just trying to wordsmith. 
and yes. make sure that we get the exact right language because when the in the first iteration of the bill when the feds actually called us and said this is very problematic you're creating a class of kids you lose all your money then they read it again and said well maybe not sure. and so as we work back and forth back and forth with with our feds um, we get clarification for them and we work with the senator to try to make sure we get the language right so that we don't hit any snags. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you both. Uh, we have a few questions from the panel. Uh, Senator Barrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. Good to see you, uh, Rinda, as well. We appreciate you guys being here. And, and as you stated, Madam Secretary, this certainly has been very emotional. Uh, the testimony that we've heard uh, has been, um, at minimum, um, just kind of heart-wrenching as some of the things that were stated. and. I, I know, because I know you, I know that you felt that as well. I mean, it, it, that was very tough to hear um, and to just kind of know what those children went through and probably still going through uh, if there's not been any intervention. There are a couple of things that I, I want to go back to that I kind of asked early on, so I kind of want to go back to it. And, and the chair kind of um, alluded to some of it because I wanted to kind of understand the – diligence piece and if y'all can kind of take me through walk me through what that process looks like when a child comes in and what steps do you take and what's the time frame because I just heard you say uh, Rhonda that really the policies that you guys have submitted is actually a little bit more tighter or more stringent than what we're looking at so kind of take me through that process first so prior to even requesting removal of a child we are obligated to work toward reunification i mean to um uh, reasonable efforts to prevent removal so that includes exploring potential relatives um, who could support the family so that work should start and is reflected in our policy that it should start well before so during the investigation if we have to remove a child that should always be the first question help me understand who's been important in this child's life what relatives what other fictive kin who's played a major role in this child's life that might be able to step in as a caregiver so that should always be the first question that we're asking because obviously that would if, if it's someone known to the child that would minimize the trauma to the child and so from that point on we have something called a um, family connections form sort of like a family tree where the worker is expected to um, meet with parents, any other relatives that um, are known or other collaterals that they've um, come in contact with this in, during the case and document who are the relatives that by law have a right to be notified. And so that should be documented on this family connections form. And then we have a document that we send out to the relative it's called a relative notification letter that lets them know that um, they we are contacting them um, because they are, are have been identified as a relative of the child we have been given custody it says that it is critically important that if you are interested in providing care or having continuing contact with this child you review the supplemental page attached and get in touch with us as soon as possible but no later than 60 days so we continue to emphasize to relatives um, and and our obligation to continue searching for relatives goes all the way until a judge relieves us of that obligation um, and and typically the permanency hearing where a judge determines are we going to continue to move toward reunification or are we going to change the goal to another permanency option happens at, a, at right at about 12 months so okay so it takes 60 days for you guys to kind of go through that process and when you send a letter to the potential family member is it just sent regular mail or is it something that you guys they didn't have to sign off so that you know that they received it no i don't believe right now that it is sent um we don't address that in policy and that that may be something that we have to address i believe it is just mailed to the to the relative what we did put in in the policy is that we expect that at the, um, if you look on page three of eight at the top, um, we have put in there that the caseworker 
who has submitted this to the court in preparation for the disposition hearing, um, that at that hearing, the DCFS legal representative shall request that the parents provide any missing information or certify that it is complete and accurate by that point. So that gives the everyone, um, the judge and everyone, the opportunity to ensure that we know who all of the relatives are and that we have all of the accurate contact information for that person. So how do you how does paternity weigh into this, and what's that process? Well, oftentimes, um, the as as you have heard others testify, the mother may say, "I'm not sure who the father is," mm -hmm. or she'll name someone, and when paternity testing is done, um, it turns out not to be that person, and then we're we're moving to the next person. So that is a, a reality of the work that we often. Are, are dealing with. It's, and, and so it's all this happening within the same 60 days? No, no, that often carries on further. Um, you okay. know, that take, that's a process that takes a while. So sometimes it's, you know, the, the mother will tell us one thing and then it's not until she'll go to court where the judge will put her on the stand, ask that she be on the stand and under oath, um, identify who are all the people that it could be. Um, if, if you're not sure who it is. And so, you know, it's one hearing to the next hearing. And so it is possible that that gets drug on. It's unfortunate. We, we agree with so much of, of, the, of the testimony and the, the problems that are just inherent with, with children coming into foster care. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, we don't disagree with our obligation to do a diligent search, to do it early, to continue to search for relatives, but we do have an obligation to continue to search and to continue to work toward reunification until the judge determines that that's no longer an obligation of ours. So um, as you were, were responding to the chairman about the other two laws and the financial impact, you said that it doesn't seem like it's a um, true comparison in terms of apples to apples to what Georgia is doing and what Arizona is the doing. The bills aren't exact, so okay. there's a little is, is variation. Is it more than just the nine months and the 12 months? Because I think that's what I wrote down in terms of what the, the I would true have to difference. lay them side by side, Senator, to 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 say exactly where the differences are. There is a difference okay. in the time frame, and there is a difference just in the wording of, um, I, 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 I believe I, I, what I'm looking at from the Georgia says that if a relative entitled to notice under subsection C of the code fails within six months from the date he or she receives a required notice, to demonstrate an interest in and willingness to provide a permanent home for the child, the court may excuse DCFS from considering such relative as a placement. Uh, we certainly have no problem with that. We, we agree with that, but that is different than what is in this proposed legislation, uh, I believe, as I, as I know it. And so you're looking at that's a law, because I, I would like to look at that, and I'd like to make sure that, you know, if we pass this, that there are no unintended, you know, consequences financially. And then I guess I just want to, I'm going to follow up with this being my, no, I have one more other question. But the presumptive, um, did, did y'all get the this amendment? Did y'all receive the amendment that we have here? Um, uh, 663? Did y'all rece receive a copy of that amendment? Senator so, McMath did send a copy of some amendments. So I, I just want to go back to the question that I had earlier on amendment number nine as it relates to, and I used the scenario if um, a father finds out, you know, that he has a child, he didn't know he had a child. Um, it, I, it was my understanding when I asked that question early on that having this language in here would assure that he would be able to, you know, go through the pro process and be able to have um, the uh, rebuttable pr presumption um, and the contradictory hearing and that he can then at that point have the opportunity to be granted his child. I is that what this does or is this something different? So if I'm following this right, um, and, and I stand to be corrected, certainly, but this amendment number nine 
really deals with the issue about the department's ability to move the child. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a different issue than the original contradictory hearing piece that, that we were talking about that would impact what you're saying. So this, this amendment number nine, um, in my opinion, deals with page four or five, line 14, where it says the Department um, of Children and Family Services shall not make a change of placement absent court approval um, upon good cause shown. So this talks about us not being able to move the child, so I believe that is what that is referring to. So then in the scenario that I used, then, then that's, that, that does not mean that that father would then have the opportunity to um, so a, a little above that okay. where it says um, in the original legislation on page four where it says that um, remove line 11 removal of the child from the caregivers would be detrimental um, there shall be a rebuttable presumption that continuation of the child's placement with the current caregivers is in the child's best interest so that was the original language that um, Judge de Planchet was most concerned with. Mm -hmm. This amended language here that deals with our ability to move a child, I'm not aware of how, how he is feeling about that one or what he said about that one. Um, I, I am concerned because I do believe we need the ability to move a child um, in certain instances without going to a court hearing. There are times, as, as you will see in, in the report, um, that about 30% of the time the child was moved because of moving to a relative where um, to preserve family ties and, and permanency. But 70% of the time it is for other, other reasons. And some of those reasons focus on the safety of the child, mm -hmm. um, the caregiver's ability to meet the needs of the child and to, ha to have to go to the court and have a hearing prior to doing something like that um, is, is concerning. Both the, the time that it would take, the ability to get those hearings. Um, so I, I believe this is some, you know, something we've talked about and I think it is something that um, Senator McMath is uh, willing to work on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would agree. You know, so there's some of the, uh, and I understand to some degree, you know, I don't know. And I know that your department is stretched, overworked, underpaid. Um, and I'm trying to see now, this falls under what part of the department that actually is responsible for this job? Foster care. Foster. Just, just, just foster care. And so the workers who work, so we, when we had the disasters, mm -hmm. were these workers pulled away to do to take care of some of the disaster stuff, I'm just wondering. We try to leave the foster care workers and the child abuse investigators okay. um, alone during disaster response and pull more from the SNAPS uh, staff and the child support enforcement staff. There were certainly some child welfare workers that had to go to disaster because the disaster was so big. But by and large, we try to leave child welfare alone during disasters. Okay. And then I guess my last question is going to be regarding some of the testimony that we heard as it relates to the threats um, that were given to the parents if they came forward. Um, Madam Secretary, and I know that just is not a part of your character, and um, I know you can't speak for all of your employees, but to, to hear that, you know, we know that is really just, you know, so unacceptable that, you know, that some parents or people would feel in fear of being able to speak up what they thought was right and, and what to do and then to be threatened um, and seemingly it's, it seemed like in one case it looked like they may not have uh, been able to be free with that and, and it seemed like there was some consequence or something did happen negatively. Uh, could you speak to that? 
Well, Senator, I'm not aware of the um, first family that testified. I don't know them and don't know that case, okay. so I can't speak to any of that. Um, okay. I'm sorry for any um, trauma that they had being foster parents with us. The second case is the case under litigation, and I can't speak to that. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, can you just speak to the fact of what the policy is at the department as it relates to that? I, I don't. I don't think we have a policy that says you're mean oh. to people. I mean, I'm. I'm sorry, Senator. I don't know exactly what you're asking me. Um, but well, I just know it that is, it is this clearly not that you guys foster that dead, dead absolutely. people. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely, not. it is completely um, communicated regularly, frequently. Okay. The expectation to partner with um, all of our stakeholders: biological parents, foster parents, providers. Um, all of our stakeholders. We have a value statement that is very strong about treating people with dignity, compassion, and respect while providing services with integrity. We take it very seriously. And I, I cannot sit here and say that that did not happen. Mm -hmm. I can sit here and say that it is absolutely unacceptable. And if we are aware of that happening and have evidence of that happening, something would be done about that. And that's what I wanted to hear. And what you know, and then making sure that people understand what that process looks like. Who do they report to, sure. and making sure that that you know that we are not having those kind of actions happening. Okay, and we thank get you, Mr. Chairman. Reports, and I talk to foster parents. Dr. Hodnett talks to foster parents constantly. I mean, that is we we'd never want anyone treated disrespectfully ever. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Barrow. Thank you for your testimony, Senator Boudreau. You next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, Madam Secretary, um, Dr. Harden. Thank you. Um, and and let, let me just finish, start with what Senator Barrow just finished on. I, I know also um, the, the work, the outreach, when we talk about foster care adoptions and, and the difficulty that we face in doing that. And uh, yeah, I would just reiterate immensely that if any of that is, is, is out there, that it be brought to the proper um, attention to the department, to the agency, to this, this committee, um, because it, it just negates all of the positive things that we do. And, and we've, we've heard some, some painful yes, testimony. Sir. And it's, it's, it's a short of insulting um, for anyone within the agency to misrepresent the values and the integrity, the hard work that, that goes into trying to, trying to make this work. Um, so um, I appreciate you saying that it, it, it goes contrary to that. I want to go a step further and, 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 and almost have a billboard that says if there is a problem out there and it still is out there, let's bring it to our attention. We go back to past October with some of these issues. And I don't, I don't want them to continue. I don't want people to be afraid to come forward. Um, we have enough obstacles in the way. Um, Secretary Waltz, I want to I wanna reiterate what the chairman said also. After our, our October meeting, I, I, I call it a road show. You did a road show um, with the, the members of this committee to, to, to find out um, you know, where, where the disconnect was, how we can effectively get that. And it's difficult to sit in that chair and to, to, to hear these stories. Um, one of the things you said back at the test in, in, um, on the um, testimony in October is some of the things that are in place are in statute mm -hmm. and that um, you couldn't do things because the statute didn't allow. And I thought you receive information during that, the, the road show, during the tour when you're talking. And I know specifically um, with, with Senator Mizell and Senator McMath um, that they brought up some information. I think the, again, um, uh, the inclusion of uh, so many others in this process is going to make this better. I mean, you inherited the statutes that are in there. Um, some of them are outdated. Uh, I spoke to uh, Senator McMath. Um, I think most of us received a call from Judge Tommy Duplanche from my area. Um, and, and he said, look, it's time that we, we look at some of the codes, to do this, but in concert. And uh, I'm not going to go on and on, but I wanted to say, when you came to the table and you said that the agency 
that you are the head of, that you are supportive of this bill and you want to make sure that it is worded properly. That spoke volumes to people who are in pain today and who have experienced what we thought maybe was isolated cases that we're hearing more and more. So um, Senator McMath has, has committed. He also spoke to Judge DePlanche last night um, from my area, and uh, he's, he's committed to, as this process continues to evolve, that we make sure that it is the best um, and that we, we do build on what we have in there and where there are some disconnects that we get it. The other thing is I know we have to work with our federal partners, and uh, I would urge um, and request if there's some additional assistance from our staff that's needed to, to expedite their response to ensure once again that this document, this bill, is, is, is exactly what it's intended to do, is to make it better and not have uh, anyone feel that this agency is it does not have the kids um, at, 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 at the priority, as the focus for what we're trying to do. I don't want them to, you know, and, and, and we can throw bullets at the federal government and we can do that, but I don't want them to come back a year from now and say it. If, if, um, and, and, and while I respect the fact that other states have done it, we live in this state and we want our state to have what's best for our people. In this case, we're talking about those kids. So whatever that time frame, and if we, if we uh, as this process continues, if we don't have that information, and if, if it means the chairman has to get a conference call with those folks, we need to know up front what, what we're dealing with, if there are any issues. And I know in talking to Senator McMath, he would be right there um, to, to make sure that it's part of his language. So I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to pass the baton. I know other members of the committee want to speak, but but uh, Secretary Walters, again, you embracing this this bill uh, sends a strong message to those who are hurting and who are in pain that this agency is willing to 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 upgrade and to be part of the solution. Um, and uh, the judges and all of those um, throughout the state, those who testified earlier. Um, with them, with, with their, their voices being included in this, it's going to make it better. So I, I just want to thank you. I want to thank Senator McMath. Um, uh, he's, uh, he's carried this. He's carried it. It's been a heavy, heavy lift for him um, because he's getting pulled in a lot of different directions, and he wants to do the right thing, and he can't do it alone. He needs all of us, and I want to thank you for your role in that. I want to thank him for his leadership in bringing this to the forefront. And, and, and uh, it's going to continue to be painful for people. And it, I think if we can display what has been displayed today in a public setting, that this agency has embraced this bill, we're going to get there. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Boudreau. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Mizell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, ladies. You all have reached out. You, you've amply uh, given us time, let us vent, let us wring our hands together. And, and I know you are so well-intentioned. I think it's really important that we leave here today all feeling a lot better than we felt in October. And I really want, there's a couple of things I want clarity on. Uh, because it's just like I said, I, I want us, I, I, you know, we believe this bill will uh, give us some peace of mind uh, in, in a lot of directions. But I'm going to take you back to the federal money. And we, we you know we just use the term federal money. That is, you're, ta you're referring to the block of money that you all get for the department? Are you getting to, is there like a, 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 I know when we talked, you talked about how they come in and they count your cases and they, and they look at the progression of the cases. So are you penalized or rewarded when handling cases in a certain way or not handling them a certain way? Because I, I really want to understand exactly what part of the federal government could say giving equal consideration to a stable environment for a child would be a penalizing option for them. So, Senator, the Title IV-E is the money that comes in that funds foster care. Say that again. 4-E is the um, section of the federal 
money that funds foster care. Mm -hmm. To for a child to be 4E eligible, certain things have to happen. That 4E money pays for it, the match rates vary. Sometimes it's 50%, sometimes it's 75%, sometimes it's 25%. It varies depending on what we're doing. It, it matches the state general fund depending on what we're doing. Training gets matched at 75%. Okay. Foster parent reimbursement gets matched at 50%. Some other um, services get matched at 25 So it's a complicated system. But the law that says the department's role cannot be usurped in the that we have the burden on determining the placement of the child and so if the and I'm, I'm not a lawyer or a social worker so i will bow to um, the experts if a judgment is made where we didn't determine the placement of the child, we would lose 4E eligibility for that case. And when in the first writing of the bill, the way the feds read it, they thought we were creating, or we thought the bill created a class, a class of kids that were the, their um, placement was going to be determined not by us. And they, that's what the flag was to them. They said, if you, you have the statutory obligation to place the child, the court approves the placement. Now, the court can say, I don't like that placement, come up with another one. Right. But it's the, the agency's job to say, we think this child should be placed in this foster home or with this relative. So, so in, the, in the Landry situation where the judge made the final decision, but it was at the recommendation of DCFS, that still would be considered a DCFS recommendation? Uh, we can't speak to the Landry uh, case. We're under litigation for that. Okay. 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 So, so I, I think my, my next question, if, if, if the chairman would allow, I, I, I would, I would I really, uh, because what you said, uh, Rinda, was, was on um, the amendment not uh, really doing what I understood it was going to do. My, I'm, I'm gonna, my understanding, and maybe I need the author back, my understanding is that, that um, well, the term, I'm not a lawyer, but the term of the rebuttable presumption was going to allow a stable environment that was not biological to be treated equally with the biological when the decision was made. Am I, am I understanding that right? And that is new, and right. so we have not presented that to the feds to ask them that. That was just discussed this morning. But, uh, but, that's, but that's what that intention is. And, I mean, it, it, am I... Do, Prior to, it would be a rebuttable presumption that continuation would be in the child's best interest. And that's what the Fed said was making a, a, a determination. A, sep a separate class. What they, what they were saying initially is that it would be, if you are applying this to all children who are in a placement for six months, it would be, and that move, it would be all children that would be in this category. And so your funding could be affected for all children. One of the things that came back to say was that we're asking for clarification because it could be on a case-by-case -case basis whether or not you end up um, being impacted financially, depending on whether or not the, um, the judge considers it on a case-by-case -case basis as opposed to just assuming that the continuation is in the child's best interest just because they've been in a placement for six months. And, and that class, that, that creating the new class is because of the six months? Because aren't, aren't children already being, uh, aren't the decisions already being made, made on what's in the best interest of the child already? So the only thing right. you're really supposed to be changing is the six months. 
So the six months is a piece that is new, is to it. And then the, the real thing is about individualizing each child. So not just as a, as a group saying that because they've been there for six months, it is presumed that it is in the child's best interest to stay in that current placement. That presumption, what they are saying is that you can't just have a presumption to that. Even if it's rebuttable, you can't have a presumption. It is an individualized decision. Each child needs to be there, their permanent goal, what's in their best interest, needs to be determined individually. And so to the extent that it, it is, and, and you know, I believe there have been some adjustments to this, we just don't have them all yet. And even but, though it's only children six and under, that doesn't... So it would only uh, impact those right, cases. Right, right. 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 So we don't, we don't think that this is creating the class. That was the Fed's first reaction. When they came back and looked at it again, they said, no, we don't think that's what it's doing. So we, the class, creating the class thing is the Feds have backed off of that. That's we why just we don't wanted, have the $20 million Right. That's it, why the fiscal note changed. Because it will be a case-by-case -case basis. Which is really Which is how every case should be. Most is, of us presumed right, it was exactly. that already. Yeah. yeah, so that, uh, okay, and since, and since Madeline was shaking her head, yes, I won't ask her for more, so thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. Senator Ward, I think, uh, oh, and we have Senator Luna after you. Senator Ward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the, I know you can't answer about litigation, but the litigation's about the content of the bill and what, and are we trying to address the content of the litigation with the content of the bill? I think the litigation is specific to a case. Right, I know, but we that's been brought up a couple times, and the only reason I'm asking is because I, are we trying to address pending litigation with the bill, and that's just something I like to know whenever we're dealing with litigation with I don't know that is Senator McMath's question no okay all right so the so this bill has nothing to do with the pending litigation no. I think the litigation probably informed the pat the writing of the bill but okay or the case maybe um that, let McMath let me, speak to that <laughs> I can I can say that and I and I don't I can't speak to the the litigation because I haven't read it or seen it or know anything about it. The litigation has absolutely nothing to do with this bill, and it was in no way a catalyst for the this bill or the language in it. I think there was uh, a case, as there have been we you know handful of these maybe more um, that has a specific set of circumstances. Um, that this is derived from, but in no way is the litigation at all a fruit. A pro this this bill is not a product of that. So as long as we stay on the content of the bill, we should be able to speak pretty freely. I would think so. Okay. Um, I know we we've gotten into some discussion about um, you know what what folks may have been told and things like that and look it's a very difficult job as a secretary or a manager of any large department or anything like that um, I think what's what's always important to uh, any secretary or any department whenever we're trying as collectively whether it be you or whether we're working with DOTD or we're working with LDH or or anybody is that we're always and I know you are that's why y'all are here uh, we're always trying to make it better and and sometimes I feel like um, whether we're trying to make a, a chair transportation so I'm always looking for ways to make transportation better um, and sometimes you can run into resistance on on some fronts um, whenever you're trying to change some things that have been done a long way, a long time. Um, and it, it, I don't know what that is so much as sometimes it's just hard maybe to hear that it's not necessarily that anybody thinks anybody 
at the table or in the room did anything specifically wrong. But sometimes a problem arises and everybody agrees that we need to make it better going forward. And the only reason I say that is um, sometimes I feel like we have to we have to get to a point where we are almost forcing conversations when we really ought to be sitting all at the table together saying, well, somewhere along along the way there was there was some misunderstandings there were some things said that shouldn't have been said regardless of who said them and we just need to make it better going forward and so let's just have the conversation on the front end and do it and and i think a lot of times it can elim eliminate a lot of the heartburn and so uh, i think we're to that point now and so i do appreciate that um one of the things that that has kind of stuck out to me, and, and I think Senator Mizell just brought brought it up, um, and y'all were talking about us. Uh, the, the federal government was had some concern at some point about creating a specific class of children. Um, the the blood relative side of things giving preference to maybe length of time in someone's care um does that preference not give um does that not is that not a specific currently because i know that's where it's weighted is that not uh, do they not consider that any kind of specific class i don't think you excuse me Excuse me. I'm Kim Glappy on Bird Train. I'm a general counsel with Department of Children and Family Services. Um, the right now, currently, we aren't giving the relatives an actual preference. The parents have the preference. We we are under um, an obligation to try to reunite um, the child with their parents, and they have their parental rights that we cannot override unless those rights are actually terminated. What it is is that with the, presum the rebuttable presumption in this um, bill and in the amendment, um, it appears to not really level the playing field, but instead it gives the foster parents actually a step up as opposed to the uh, biological relatives of the child. So instead of them being equal the foster parents actually would have the step up because they have the rebuttable presumption that it's in the best interest of their of the child after just six months in the home um, that their that placement is in the best interest of the child and so we the department has to overcome that presumption so you see so it's actually the foster parent is being given the leg up but, but this says, and I'm reading from the, while the law requires that relatives are given preferential consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But they are. Yeah. Come relative. on, sit down. I'm not sure. What? If you just want to read that. No, I don't. So what are we saying? Never will I'll read this right. in the area. Candace, please sit down and please speak to it. You know it. You can yeah, share Candace sit here, but she's actually, I'm going to let the Deputy we'll let the General Counsel speak to this. She's actually interacted with the feds on And I'm this. not trying to muddy the water. I'm just. Right. And Senator Ward, you're talking from the policy right now, not the bill. Right. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, but the policy is based, I'm sorry, my name's Candace LeBlanc. Um, the policy is based on what the federal law states and what the federal law states in the Social Security Act is that um, when the 40 agency is determining a placement for a child, the, the agency consider giving preference to an adult relative over a non-related caregiver provided that the rela uh, relative caregiver meets all relevant child protection standards. So we are required Wait, can initially you read the first, to Do you provide, mind reading the first part again for me? Uh, I apologize. I was trying to track the wording. 
Okay, it, 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 it's in the, the federal law, the Social Security Act, and it, it requires that when a Title IV-E agency is determining a placement for a child, the agency consider giving preference to an adult relative over a non-related caregiver, provided that the uh, relative caregiver meets all relevant child protection standards. So that is in federal law. Right. And, that's and so the reason I got you to read it again is because this says the law requires relatives are given preferential treatment, but what you just read says consider giving preferential treatment, which is the same, different. Mm -hmm. And so, why are we? Why do we not have in the policy consider giving as opposed to the law requires giving? Honestly, I, I mean, I can't speak to that. I know that the feds have stressed to us on numerous occasions through policy, through guidance, uh, through federal law that, you know, that they are promoting, you know, uh, relatives over any other placement, at least initially, you know. I mean, and I'm, I understand that. I think, I think it kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier. I think all things considered, if... Mm -hmm. if something happens and then you know I would think about in, in my family if, if something happened to um, my sister I'd be there tomorrow and so I think a lot of things are contemplated under those scenarios and so I think we're kind of today we're talking in terms of something a little bit different but just if we could if we could try and give some thought and and maybe as as we move forward through this process keep in mind it doesn't for all of our edification it doesn't seem to require that relatives it seems to require that that's given consideration and i just wanted to point that out thank you senator ward senator luno i think after your question the board will be clear thank you mr chairman uh ladies i want to address this just a little bit deeper and get in the weeds just a little bit more I'm, I'm not convinced of this argument that we're going to jeopardize federal funding because as a policy, we, the, the legislature is a policymaking body and we can establish parameters within which the department makes a placement. The bill, the, the current law, as well as the proposed bill, it's my appreciation that it says specifically that the department makes the placement, mm -hmm. but within certain parameters. So are you saying that you believe the parameters that we're putting in place could jeopardize the funding? Because we have lots of parameters in place already and have for years and years. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a two-pronged thing with the federal, the federal funding. It was one, uh, uh, the authority and control over the placement. And that's the, the area that we have received some, you know, kind of feedback from the feds and, the, and, and what they were explaining about, you know, that they backed off from thinking that this was a class and all. Mm -hmm. The other piece of the, uh, the question about federal funding that we have not received uh, specific guidance from the feds is regard to the fact that they have uh, placed the language in this bill. Uh, they've um, created a new permanent plan for the child. Under federal law, the only permanent plans that are recognized is, of course, return to, uh, to the family, second, uh, adoption, third, guardianship, you know, and then we go down to, you know, legal custody and then a long-term placement. Well, let's, let's go back to child. my question because my question is we, we've got tons of parameters on, on how the department gets to make a placement. Why are these any different? Well, the, that's the thing is that this is creating a new permanent plan that's not recognized by the feds. And the feds require us to make reasonable efforts to finalize a permanent plan when we get to that point in the child's case. Maybe that's so what I'm missing. they've created a, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Tell me, tell me what the, the change is to the permanent plan. How is this okay, one different? Okay, the change is, is where they added kinship care. On, the, on the, defini um, the definition where they have adoption and our kinship care. Kinship care is not necessarily defined in, in Louisiana law or not recognized. And then two, what is it? Because is it is it custody or is it guardianship? It seems like it's a permanent plan that's less than the most um, permanent plan. Like, 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 like guardianship would be more permanent than kinship care. Uh, seems like to me that uh, 
permanent than kinship care. Okay. It seems like to me that's that's something that be could be fixed. Right. I mean, if if you if you only if you only have a problem with tweaking a few words or something like that is what it sounds like to me. Your issue is we can fix that. Could uh, so you know, let's 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 work with let's work with with the, the stakeholders and see if we can correct that problem because honestly, y'all put a lot more stock in that than I do. I mean, we have way more restrictive laws in place in Louisiana than what what the language is from the feds on this and that's been okay for decades mm -hmm. I don't see you know why this one can't be addressed and worked out too so thank you thank you Senator Luno and thank you everybody from DCFS for your testimony and uh, I do see so many members from DCFS and we want to thank you for your, your work all of you for your work and we do have the Murrays that are still in attendance. So if somebody does want to visit with them concerning that statement that was made by Mr. Murray, we would sure appreciate that. Well, you could. I think Senator Barrow had some thoughts. I just wanted to kind of come back because I was waiting to see if um, my question could be readdressed based upon the information that we heard. Um, as it relates to the last amendment and so uh, uh, on page nine and, and and i didn't hear it because I'm, I'm not an attorney so I, I wasn't quite sure but based upon what i heard from you miss renda my scenario that i gave about the father who finds out that he has a child that he did not know about now that that's going to be treated equal as the parent, the foster parents that may currently have the child. Is that your understanding? I think that's what I heard you say, and I was waiting for see if anybody else was going to ask that question. But is, is that how that would be viewed? And then what happens with that father at that point once he, once he learns that information? What, 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 be, what would be the steps in that process? I just want to I just want to point out you you're talking it, it's kind of apples and oranges because okay. you're talking about fathers and a parent and a parent's right and they have a a very strong uh, constitutional right to their children so how we would respond in that situation with regards to a parent would be different than what this situation is okay. trying to address when you're talking about relatives versus a foster parent. So in the, it, you said it'd be different, but he just finds out in the child's in foster care, mm -hmm. then what happens? So the, the challenge for us is if he just finds out at six months. Right, or later. He, he has family who had no idea mm -hmm. that their grandchild might have been um, that they had a grandchild or that the grandchild was in foster care. And so that was why we were proposing 12 months, because at 12 months we are obligated to give a permanent, a recommendation for a permanent plan. So at 12 months, we can't wait anymore for relatives to, to come forward. Gotcha. So that so was So even the, if the father finds out after 12 months? Not the, well, so the father may maintain greater rights, but his family okay. said would not. Gotcha. Okay, so that's, that would be the difference. Uh, okay, that's that's because I, I think I've been asking the same question and just wasn't really getting clarity on the answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, and other than that, uh, what is your greatest pause to the bill as amended at this point? Other than, because I sound like, seem like I heard the funding issue may have been addressed. I've been watching it from the back. I've been listening. Um, seem like a, a few uh, tw uh, tweaking words may be able to address that. Is there anything else that we are missing? So we discussed prior to this hearing um, with Senator McMath and the people helping him to write the bill some changes that we've not had a chance to vet. So, okay. for instance, um, modifying some of that language in that paragraph here that we talked about to add um, kin. And so we just need to look at the way that's defined okay. in federal law and whether that has any unintended consequence. I don't believe he has an intention to um, create any issues with it, but we just haven't had an opportunity yet to explore that. The other piece is um, making sure that we re retain the ability to move a child as necessary for their health and safety prior to having to have a, a court hearing. That, that is a concern. 
that yeah, I don't is. know that we figured out yet. Okay. Um, how to work through that part. Okay. And I, 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 yeah, I can see the issue with that. Members, as I stated when I first came up, we, we are, we are not opposing this bill. We are here to work with Senator McMath to make sure that we get the language right so we don't have any okay. federal problems, we don't have any constitutional problems. We just want the words right because words matter. Yes. And so, but we appreciate the the time and the energy and the effort and the intent of this bill. And we want to work with the Senator. We have been working with him. Okay. And um, we're listening to all our stakeholders, to the judges. The Judge Deplanche is the head of the Juvenile Judges Association. So when he was speaking, he was speaking on behalf of multiple judges that had come to him with concerns. We got to make sure that our judiciary is on the same page with us so that we we don't get into court hearings and we're struggling there so our intent is to get this right and we believe that that is the senator's intent and so that's where we are on this all this feels like a lot of nitpicking and wordsmithing and all of that well it's because the words matter with our with our money with the feds with the you know and our we most just vulnerable have population. Right. Absolutely. You very well said, Madam Secretary. Um, I, I seem like we're in the same book, yep. just maybe not in the same chapter yet, <laughs> but I think that we can get there. And so uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Very good. We want to thank you all for your testimony. And thank you all for your information that you provided for us. Senator McMath, as you come to, to close your bill, I, I do want to thank you for your work, and I, I, I speak on behalf of Ms. Cannon and Ms. Peck. I think the only day you didn't call us was Easter Sunday to talk about the bill. <laughs> so I want to tell you how hard he's been working on it. He, t he told us, he said, on Holy Saturday, I'm going to take Easter Sunday off, but I'll call you back on Monday. So I want his constituents and I want all of the public to know he's been working hard on this legislation. On that note, you can close your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, sincerely for for working with us and working with me and um, and all the stakeholders that are involved and and thank you uh, for all those who testified uh, today as well I know this is um, chairman said that this is a this committee can get emotional and it's I think I'm like two for eight in terms of tears shed <laughs> um, I just I just ask that you that you you all support the children in Louisiana and the department and their policies uh, by supporting this bill. And with that, I ask for favorable. Ask, uh, we have a motion. Amended. Yes. We have a motion from uh, Senator McMath to report Senate Bill 143 with amendments. Is there any opposition to the motion? Seeing there's no opposition, Senate Bill 143 will be reported with amendments. And Senator Barrow for one last statement. And okay. I, I really wish I had made this uh, statement early on, but I do want to say that, you know, as we are looking to address this, this issue and to really bring some great resolve to this matter, that we look at how the department is funded. So as we move forward, that we keep make this a top priority to make sure that they are receiving the funding they need to be able to do the job that they've been asked to do. Very well said.